they want, yes. Thanks. Okay, so I think now we are recording. And um, yeah, how are you still waiting? There's Martin. Oh, he's coming. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And uh, oh, I was actually also counting on some people from CMU. They are not here yet. Oh, they'll have to wake up. Yeah. You again? No. So we just CMU. open up it's, the it's at CMU. Sorry, what did you say, Andre? I'm, I'm going to disable the waiting room. Oh, uh, if, yes. If we please. get anybody we don't know, I will quiz them as to who, you know, who are you? Yeah. Okay, yeah. That sounds all right. Thanks, Daria. Maybe uh, wait uh, just a couple of more minutes. Yeah, we're waiting a couple of more minutes. So uh, we keep... In Dublana, we keep a book on the seminar on foundations uh, in paper form with participants signing. What we're hoping is that one day we will sell this because it will have a very famous signature somewhere in here. Uh, anyway, now lately they have all looked like this, online seminar, online seminar, no signatures. But I'm glad to report that this is a, a this is a, the new era because it's a new notebook. We ran out of space in the old one, so this ah, is the, the 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 second era of this seminar. We have a very nice round number today, which is sixty four. <laughs> okay. So Egbert, whenever you feel like it, just. Yeah, I think I think we are going I to start. We have oh. a CMU representative. We're okay, fine. okay. Now, now we have a quorum. <laughs> Good morning, Thank Steve. Good Thank morning. you for inviting us, Egbert. Thank yes, you. of course. <laughs> Been looking forward to this. Um, okay, so um, we are going to start. Uh, we have a, a, an extended seminar today um, with uh, John Cartmel and uh, and some of us. And uh, yeah, we are extremely happy that uh, John uh, is picking up his old research subject again and that we get to hear about um, what he is up to regarding contextual categories. Um, so I'm very uh, pleased to have you. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be able to talk about some of the stuff that I'm doing at the moment uh, and still thinking about. Um, what I need to do is share a screen, isn't it? Yep. Um, oh. Um, you know, uh, yes. uh, participants are allowed to share screens, so it should be okay. Okay, great. So, um, do we see? Yep. Do we see a, a PDF document, a research overview? Yep. Great. And I might switch off my video if I can do that, which might um, improve matters. Okay, good. So, um, might be a bit unusual, but what I'd like to do is just give a quick run through of all the things that I'm sort of thinking about in the last couple of years, really, um, some of which is developments of the original work that I did, my thesis, uh, and some of it is uh, about the theory of data, which I'll give you a quick overview of my thinking on that and the, what, I, what I'm working towards at the moment. Um, First of all, just two things. One is all the source of all the documents that I'll be talking about are on GitHub. Um, uh, there's no privacy settings on those. So by default, they're public. Um, and occasionally I post PDFs at ResearchGate, uh, you know, when I think they're getting a bit closer to being uh, worthy of other people looking at them. Um, starting with the mathematical theory of data, well, there isn't a mathematical theory of data at the moment, but I think there ought to be. 
Uh, it hasn't been developed yet. When it is developed, I think it'll be a very significant uh, with practical benefits. And this theory, when it is developed, will include morphisms, commutative diagrams, pullbacks, co-products maybe. Some of my recent thinking I've put on ResearchGate as a preparation for a mathematical theory of data. I'd quite like it if you know someone goes and has a look at that and sees what they make of it. It's a very abstract sort of uh, level of looking at it. But in this paper, there's a definition of maximal constrainedness of a category with respect to a set of functors into the category of finite sets. And I'd ask anyone that does go and have a look at it, do you recognize that definition? Has someone else used it somewhere else? So roughly speaking, the category represents a data specification. Each functor into the category of finite sets represents an instance of this data specification. The set of functors as a whole represents the requirement for the data specification. So if I'm specifying some data, I've got a requirement for what I want to store in that data structure. The maximal constrainedness of the category with respect to the requirement represents that the data specification can't be well improved upon, replaced by a better data specification i.e. one that better fits the data. So in this abstract setting, I'm able to give definitions of two key concepts from relational data theory, or an abstract primitive version of those definitions, namely those, the definitions of functional dependency and referential inclusion dependency. I'm able to define what it means for dependency, dependencies of either type to be represented in the data specification, i.e. in the category. And finally, I'm able to prove that if a data specification is maximally constrained to a requirement, then all functional dependencies and referential inclusion dependencies present in the requirement are represented in the data specification. And in this way, and in this abstract setting, this shows that prescriptions like PF Codd's third normal form criteria for relational data design, which is a principle of goodness for a relational data scheme, are actually corollaries to a more fundamental goodness principle to the effect that a data specification considered as a theory must be maximally constrained, i.e. the tightest available theory for fitting the facts. And the great thing about this, for me at least, is that it makes perfect sense. It makes that a theory should be maximally constrained and best fit the facts. And it sort of removes some of the mystery that, for me at least, surrounds relational data theory. And a more fully fledged theory of data which is as yet unfinished. If you bear with me, I'd like to read what I have as the abstract at the moment. Um, and really it just gives some indication of, of how I'm thinking about these things really and, and the significance of them. We present a formal abstract definition of data specification that is sufficiently general to encompass relational schemas of COD's relational data model hierarchical schemas such as those of the nested relational data model, such as those that are implemented in XML and represented in XML schemas, and those represented in variants of interface definition language and implemented in various open and proprietary formats, most recently in Google's protocol buffer format. The definition abstracts from entity relationship models in the binary relationship style as described by Barker and others. And we call such data specifications ER schemas. We define an ER model to be such a schema along with its intended usage. Its intended usage is expressed as a notional set of defining instances associated with the schema. Those versed in category theory will see such presentations, sorry, will see such schemas as presentations of categories with additional structure 
and the defining instances as a set of structure preserving functors into a suitably structured category of sets. After giving the definition, we define goodness criteria for such ER models that generalize the normal form criteria of relational data model. We define sufficient conditions under which an ER model can be transformed into a relational schema in an appropriate normal form. In doing so, we provide a theoretical basis for the elimination of the normalization step from the relational design workflow in favor of the emphasis on goodness criteria for entity relationship models. This style came about, the binary relationship style, the entity relationship model, came about historically as a practical alternative to the entity relationship model presented by Chen as a unified model of data. This paper provides substance to Chen's idea of a unified model of data, but exceeds his ambition by not requiring a separate normalization step in relational design. In this way, this paper points the way to a significant improvement in software lifecycle methodology. And actually, the um, when you look at what you need to add to a category to make it into a, a realistic uh, notion of data specification, it's not particularly pretty when you first look at it. Um, one of the things that makes it a little bit um, a little bit more sense of it in my mind is um, if we recognize that there are two classes of types involved and we can give them some names. Um, so the system, as I describe it, involves definitions of both types of particulars in terms of the and it, the definition of types of particulars in terms of the relationships with all the types and there are, of which there are two kinds, those such as represent numbers, character strings, booleans and so on, all of whose instances are universals. And the remaining types, the definienda, those types, all of whose instances are particulars. So thinking of it in terms of category, in, 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 the, in the category, there's actually two two classes of objects in the category uh, with different properties. There are types which we, objects which we're thinking represent types of particulars and objects which are representing types of universals. Um, I wrote about contextual categories and hierarchical data models in 86 in a conference paper. Um, one of the things I defined there was something I call the network category. That wasn't a very good definition. It was a very poor definition, in fact. Um, I'm working on a replacement for that definition currently, which I've got the name dependency category for at the moment. I'll say a little bit more about those in a moment. Uh, this is an overview, so I'm jumping around. Uh, the next thing I thought I'd like to mention is that uh, I've done a little bit of work recently on a question, on trying to resolve a question that I raised in my thesis and then in the paper that I published in 86, um, based on my thesis. And I asked the question, when was it safe, sound, to drop variables? from terms in a generalized algebraic theory. So variables that in the formal theory have to be there are routinely dropped in practice. So we write F composition G in the theory of categories. We don't write F composition subscript X comma Y comma Z G. Um, so I've, I've a partial solution to the general problem. I didn't have any solution at the time when I wrote my thesis. Um, I think it is something worth working on. Um, if anyone's interested in, if anyone's asked themselves that question, why is it that we can drop variables? Um, just, uh, I'd be happy to, you know, to, uh, 
uh, if someone wanted to get in contact. Uh, contextual categories. Um, just background in my, which of course uh, Vladimir has as C systems. Uh, in my thesis, I proved that the category of generalized algebraic theories is equivalent to the category of contextual categories. And there's a full proof in there. Um, I have written up a generalized algebraic axiomatization of contextual categories. So there is a generalized algebraic theory whose algebras are contextual categories. And I've done that because I learned from Vladimir about the S operator, so that enabled me to do that. Uh, and you can find that on ResearchGate. Also in that document, I gave another, I do give another axiomatization that doesn't use the S operator. But I have to say that I arrived at that with knowledge of Vladimir's S operator and his, you know, his insight into how uh, those pullbacks can be got rid of and replaced by some algebraic operators. Metagat algebras. Uh, I actually came to these algebras before I came to contextual categories. And these algebras are pretty much the same as I understand it, or I don't understand fully, as Vladimir's B systems. So Medigat algebras are alternatives to contextual categories, if you like. Um, so we can formalize the connection by showing that the category of generalized algebraic theories is equivalent to the category of Metagat algebras. And I'm hoping to come back and, and just give a bit a very brief overview of what Metagat algebras look like when I've gone through this overview. So I wrote details, <laughs> not, 19, not 1997. <laughs> I wrote details, uh, I, I wrote out the proof that the category of generalized algebraic theories is equivalent to the category of Metagat algebras in 1977 as in a draft thesis. Um, and so it follows that the category of Metagat algebras and the category of contextual categories are equivalent. And I've considered, and I considered in 1997, of 1977, let me get it right, I considered uh, writing that proof out then for my thesis, but didn't do so. Um, my most recent, I, I recently attempted to develop a term rewrite system in terms of the theory of contextual categories, which I thought would automate some of the legwork, but it wasn't successful in that. There is a generalized algebraic theory of Metagat algebras, and you can find that on ResearchGate. Categories, categories with families. Um, they were defined by Peter Diver, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrongly, to play something like the role of contextual categories. A category of families has representations of both types and terms as well as context and context realizations. Unlike contextual categories and metagat algebras, there are CWFs, categories with families, that don't correspond to any generalized algebraic theory. And Peter and some others, and I've not put the reference in here, have defined conditions under which a CWF does correspond precisely to a generalized algebraic theory. And they have called these contextual CWFs. And the base category of a contextual CWF is a contextual category. And to put it another way, a contextual category with families is precisely the same thing as a 
contextual category with families. So it's a contextual category with some families added to. And because those families can be derived from the contextual category, I'm not quite sure why the families are good to have, but they may well be. Recently, I read a note by Peter, um, well, there's then Pierre Koch and, and Martin Escardo, a note on generalized algebraic theories and categories with families, which Peter sent to me. And it made me think that I need to better explain the tie up between generalized algebraic theories and contextual categories. So I started writing a doc, some notes to send to Peter, and, and I hope to just drill into those after I've gone through this overview. Already said that I'm interested in something which I've been calling dependency categories. So these are another equivalent structure. Vladimir probably wouldn't like to be calling them categories, so maybe we should call them D systems. I tried to describe them in 1986 and didn't get it right, really. I'm quite struck by the possibility that there might be three ways to represent general al al generalized algebraic theories which would be metagat algebras, contextual categories, and dependency categories. Though actually dependency categories, stroke D systems, are not quite as general as the other two. But my reason for being interested in them is that they're one piece of the jigsaw of a mathematical theory of data, in my opinion. And one way of thinking about them is what happens if we modify the notion of generalized algebraic theory to obtain a variant notion of theory in which context, instead of being finite sequences of, some, of assumptions, a finite sets of assumptions. So can we do this? If we can, then the corresponding algebras of context and realizations will be dependency categories. So the abstract for this currently reads like this. The motivation has been to formalize and foreground the network structure of tight dependencies so as to provide a theoretical foundation for the use of networks of composition relationships in entity modeling as applied both conceptually and for practical purposes in systems development. The objects of categories either persuasion, either contextual categories or dependency categories, can be thought of as context or as types that vary, also known as dependent types. But equally, they can be thought of as entity types in the center used in entity model. The morphisms of either correspond to the many one binary relationships that are the staple fare of entity modeling. And in either case, there is a distinguished subset of morphisms depicted on diagrams using a triangular headed arrow. In a contextual category, the distinguished subset forms a hierarchy. In a dependency category, the distinguished morphisms form not a hierarchy, but a wide acyclic subcategory. In either case, the distinguished morphisms correspond to certain relationships known as composition relationships, which feature in certain styles of entity modeling, and which were implied in the influential paper by Chen, who introduced the idea of certain entities being dependent on binary relationships with other entities for both their identification and their existence. Another way of approaching this is to what a dependency category might be, is to ask the question, given a contextual category, is there a full and faithful quotient category in which the very, very asymmetric local Cartesian product of the contextual category structure is collapsed down to a symmetric local Cartesian product? To do that, we're going to have to rule out some contextual categories whose Cartesian product isn't right cancellative, which is why dependency categories are not quite as general. So to help clarify this question, I wrote a short note on full faithful quotients, really, of categories, which are described as congruent structures. 
and that paper is on research case. And then I've used that definition of a congruent structure to be able to produce um, categories with symmetric Cartesian products from categories with less well behaved, less products that aren't symmetric but have pretty well behaved associative Cartesian products. But I need to be able to apply that same technique to categories with slightly less well behaved products to do what I want to do and, and produce quotient dependency categories from contextual categories. Other matters, these are things, not, um, not things that I'm working on, but things that I'd just like to sort of flag up as things that are probably good to work on. So in my thesis and then in the paper that I wrote around that material, I describe um, a generalized algebraic functor to be a functor that's induced by an interpretation of one generalized algebraic theorem in the normal. And then I claim that all generalized algebraic functors have a left adjoint, which is a generalization of Lebesgue's theorem that all algebraic functors have a left adjoint. And a year or two back, Jonathan Sterling asked me about the proof of this. And I was a little bit embarrassed because I hadn't realized that you know, I didn't have a proof to hand. Uh, and, and so as far as I know, unless somebody's worked on this in the meantime, uh, that hasn't been written up. Um, just going on down, um, some time ago, I swapped emails with Richard Garner and he suggested to me that there was a class of generalized algebraic theories for which the algebras, essentially the category of algebras is isomorphic to the category of algebras over a monad on a certain category or on a related category of set value functors. And because I was giving this presentation, I just went back and had a a bit more of a think about that. And it seems to me that we can almost certainly characterize that class of interpretations between generalized algebraic theories, such that the corresponding generalized algebraic functor is monadic, which I think is sort of interesting. And, and from that characterization, I'm thinking, will follow. Richard's account of what is basically the equivalent of metagat algebras or B systems. The known result that the category of categories is monadic over the category of reflexive graphs. The known result that the category of reflexive graphs is monadic over the set. And the known result that the category of categories, category of categories, is not monadic over the set. So I think that would be really quite an interesting piece of work. Um, and just finally in this sort of space, Levia defined algebraic structure to be something that sort of plucks algebraic structure out of categories with get filters into set. And that generalizes to the case of many sorted algebraic theories. So can that be lifted in some way, shape, or form to generalize the algebraic theories? I really don't know what the answer to that is. It would be interesting to know. Um, the word equivalent is sort of much overused, so I, I was looking for another word to use instead of the, using the word equivalent. I, so I decided to use the word fungible which I learned from Ian Stewart uh, in one of his books. So I'm going to say that two theories are fungible when one is just as good as the other for the purpose at hand. So the question is, are the theories of metagat algebras, contextual categories, contextual categories with families fungible? Or is one of these better than the others? 
So I've in the past been of the opinion that all three are fungible, but also that there's a primacy of the first over the second over the third, and this because the second and the third, all in foul of Occam's razor, as it were, multiply entities needlessly. Recently, I've become unsure that these three theories are fungible. It kind of depends, of course, on what the purpose at hand is. So to investigate what we might mean by fungible, consider two generalized algebraic theories, U1 and U2. Once U1 says A is a type, B is a type, F is a function from B to A. And the other one says A is a type and B is an A-indexed family, basically. What do we know? We know that the categories of U1 algebras and the categories of U2 algebras are equivalent. But with respect to an arbitrary contextual category C, the category of internal U1 structures and the category of internal U2 structures will not necessarily be equivalent. But if the category has strong sigma structure and strong identity sites, as has FAM, contextual category, family of sets, then these two categories of internal structures are equivalent. And this comes about because the two theories are not isomorphic in the category of generalized algebraic theories. You can't interpret one theory in the other and then map it back again. But the theories are isomorphic in the category of generalized algebraic theories enriched with strong sigma types and strong identity theories. So I've been guilty of double think in the past. I've always instinctively felt that U1 and U2 were not fungible, but the theories of contextual categories and metagap algebras were fungible. Both can't be true, it seems to me. Another example actually is that categories, the theories of the categories with finite products and the theory of the category, <laughs> the theory of Cartesian multi-categories. So these are fungible if the purpose at hand is to look at such structures in terms of FAM, but not so if the purpose is to look at such structures in terms of more general contextual categories, in particular ones that, in particular, ones that don't have strong sigma types and identity types. So the conclusion of this afterthought for me is that it'd be improper for foundations to start with contextual categories or C systems or categories, uh, contextual CWS with families. So if a foundation is to start with any such thing, it should start with metagat algebras, stroke B systems. They might be fungible, I don't know, depending on exactly how these systems are expressed. Okay, there's my overview. I'd like to drill down into a couple of things, if I may. First thing I'd like to drill down to is some, uh, some notes that I've recently written where I've been trying to tie together generalized algebraic theories and contextual categories in a way that's a bit more sort of open to, a bit more open than, than the way it was done in my thesis in a way. So in these notes, I describe quite a broad notion of a model of a generalized algebraic theory by defining the notion of an instance of a generalized algebraic theory U in a contextual category C. In a background, terminology and so on. So a contextual category as a rooted omega tree of objects. I'm going to say that an element, sorry, an object of the contextual category covers another object. So I'm gonna say Y covers X, if X less than Y and there isn't an intermediate object in the 
partial order. So essentially, y is a type that directly depends on x. So I'm going to say y covers x. So cover of x is a set of y's. I'm going to say that the uh, canonical morphisms describe this piece of Y for an object Y in a contextual category are direct dependency morphisms. I'm going to use the word section. So section is a morphism S from X to Y, where Y covers X such that S composed with piece of Y's identity on X. So every object in the contextual category has a set of sections. I'm going to um, I'm going to use a tuple notation. So this diagram here is the pullback diagram in a contextual category it is a pullback diagram. So it's a pullback of a dependency morphism across any other morphism. And because it's a pullback diagram for every H1 and H2 such that the outer diagram commutes, there is an H such that the triangles commute. I'm going to use the notation. Well, what I really should use, if I'm going to use any such notation, uh, is tuple of H1, H2, sub X, sub Y, sub F, sub Z, which can safely be elided to the pair H1, H2, sub F, comma Z, rather less safely, but a lot more conveniently to just the pair of H1 and H2. And if you do that, then the equations, you know, the triangles from above are that the pair H1, H2 composed with the projection from F star Z is H1. And the pair H1, H2 composed with, shall we call it the secondary projection, QF comma Z is H2. A bit more terminology or notation, I should say. If X less than Y, then I'm going to denote by P Y comma X, P subscript Y comma X the morphism from Y to X, which is the, the composition of all the dependency morphisms uh, from Y down to X in the tree of objects. I'm also going to use this notation here, X cross sub W Y for the pullback obtained by piecing together the primitive pullbacks that are available in the contextual category to get a pullback of P, P script, subscript Y comma W below P subscript X comma W. So if W is less than X and W is less than Y in the contextual category, then there's a unique sequence of contextual, sorry, there's a unique sequence of dependency morphisms down from X to W and down from Y to W. And when I pull one of those back along the other, I'm going to call it X, the object that I get, X cross of W, Y, as in this diagram, well, as summarized in this diagram. And of course, X sub one Y is the Cartesian product of X and Y. And that notation extends to morphisms, so I can easily define F cross sub W G. So that sort of gets out of the way some of the notations that I want to use in an example I'm about to give. Um, and they, these are notations that I use when I'm working in contextual categories. 
so the notion of an instance returning to the subject of this note um, uh, I've, in this note there's a definition of an instance of a generalized algebraic theory of you in a contextual category C and in essence such a, an instance of I consists of a consistent mapping of the derived type rules the T rules of the theory to the objects of C and the derived epsilon rules of the theory to the sections of C and of course it's such that the axioms of the theory are satisfied in C when each side is mapped into C and there is quite a bit of detail um, in, in, in giving the definition but as a result of that definition we can prove that the uh, an instance I of theory U in contextual category C is completely determined by the mapping of the introductory rules of U. And such an instance, we say, is an internal U structure in the contextual category C. We can define a category of internal U structures. So an object of that category is a pair C comma I where C is a contextual category and I is an instance of U in that category. Morphisms defined in a sort of usual sort of way. There is an alternative definition and it's one, an internal definition of internal U structure in the contextual category C. And that's the one that I relied on in my thesis. And it's that an internal U structure in C is a contextual category, sorry, is a contextual functor from the contextual category C of U that corresponds to U to contextual category C. So to every contextual, sorry, so every theory U, there's a contextual category C of U as part of the isomorphism equivalence of and theories. A functor from a contextual functor from C of U to an arbitrary category is exactly the same thing as an internal U structure in the contextual category C. So in this way, the category of internal U structures is isomorphic to a co-slice category of the category of contextual categories. And the Interesting thing is, <laughs> if we come to this, if we look at the definition, I'm not going through the definition here, but if we look at the definition here of what an instance of a theory in a contextual category is, we can see that it's actually generalized algebraic. So that to every generalized algebraic theory U, there is a theory of internal U structures. So let's call this U hat. So U hat is an extension of the generalized algebraic theory of contextual categories by a set of rules, introductory rules and axioms, that have the empty context as premise. So it's sort of an extension by constants and equational identities between closed terms. And vice versa, every such extension of the theory of contextual categories is pretty much a specification of a generalized algebraic theory, which seems kind of curious. Um, so what I'm saying there is that we could for every U, there's a U hat. So the category of U hat algebras is isomorphic to the category of internal U structures. And the implications of the implication of that, drawing it out a bit further. Well, in my thesis, um, I describe or quite briefly, the initial algebra of a generalized algebraic theory, using notation 
case of u for the initial algebra of the theory u. So I've got two different descriptions of the initial, algebra, initial object of the category of internal u structures. One of them is as the initial algebra of the theory u hat. And the other is more or less as the trivial instance of the theory u in the contextual category corresponding to u, which is CU. And, um, and actually, I, I, I wrote this out just to repeat myself. I wrote this out having read the paper that Peter sent me. Um, so it triggered this sort of thought process. Um, uh, uh, I hope that's of some interest. But what the definition of instance, the, the definition, having a definition like this of instance of theory in contextual category, it's a bit easier to work with the implications than working with well, an internal use structure is a contextual filter from C of U to C. So I've written out a couple of examples and I'll just show you one of them. Again, triggered by reading the paper that Peter sent me. So there's a general, well, there's an algebraic theory of monoids, of course. So in particular, <laughs> there's a generalized algebraic theory of monoids. So we can go through the steps of looking to see what the theory U hat is when U is the theory of internal monoids. And I've, there's, there's actually quite a bit of detail to be worked through when I present that in this note no day. But just to give you the outcome of that, the outcome so the outcome is that the generalized algebraic theory of internal monoids, so U hat will use the theory of monoids, is the theory of contextual categories plus. So the theory of contextual categories has a sort for objects and a sort for home. Actually, it's got a family of sorts for objects and it's family of sorts for home. But um, the, the extension of that theory of contextual categories is that there is a constant of M of type Hom, that there is a constant unit of type Hom one comma N, that there is a constant mult of type Hom N cross of one N to N, and that these three axioms hold. So working through the detail, we get the answer that we should have got, which is, for example, given by Barr and Wells in their book, is a description of a monoid internal, in their case, to a category of finite limits. And also in this note, I derive a description of presentation of the generalized algebraic theory of internal categories. So I think that better illustrates the tie up. I think if you go through the detail of this, so hopefully that's of interest to people. I'd like to just drill down in uh, for a few minutes. Not sure how I'm doing for time, but I'd just like to switch now and just talk a little bit about meta algebra rather than just. Um, uh, you have about five more minutes or so. oh, okay. a, a bit more if you want, but not okay. too much. Thank you. Um, I'll be pretty quick, actually. Um, so in this note, I describe a generalized algebraic theory of generalized algebraic theories, which is to say it's a meta theory of generalized algebraic theories, which is why I call it meta gaps. Um, Contextual categories contain structure that is in some sense redundant, 
this is in the same way that a Levere algebraic theory contains redundant structure compared to the otherwise equivalent notion from universal algebra of an abstract clone. In both cases, the redundancy is introduced in order to achieve a definition in which the algebras are categories with some sort of additional structure. Remove the redundancy and it's no longer explicitly a category in the definitions. Metagat algebra consists of an omega tree of objects and for each object X a set said to be the set of sections of X. And it comes equipped with three operations, star, cross and delta. So one way of explaining what constitutes a metagat algebra is to say that it consists of an omega of the omega tree of objects of a contextual category, along with for each object its set of sections and with operations and axioms that completely encapsulate the structure of the contextual category. To describe the operations star and cross formally is, is um, it's a bit beyond me right now, but I can give you an idea of, of how, they get, how it goes. And if we just concentrate on the diagram, the top diagram here, and, and I can say that this sort of encapsulates the introductory rules for the star operation. So the way I'd like you to read this diagram is to say that if X is an object of the algebra, if Y covers X, if Z1 covers Y, if zi plus one covers zi, and if z covers zn, then f star z1 covers x, f star zi plus one covers f star zi, and so f star z covers f star zn. If in addition g is a section of z, then f star g is a section of f star z. That pretty much sums up the star operation. Similarly, I'd like you to read this diagram as given the introductory rules of the cross operation. So in this case, if W is an object of the algebra, if X covers W, if Y1 covers W, if y, <laughs> YI plus one covers YI and Y covers Y. Then X cross sub W Y one covers X, X cross Y I plus one covers X cross sub W Y I, X cross sub W Y covers X cross sub W Y N. And in addition, if G is a section of Y, then X cross sub W G is a section of X cross W Y. That sums up the introductory rules. So one way of looking at this is that star is the substitution operation and cross is weakening, which are very syntactic sort of ways of looking. Final operation, if Y is an object that covers X in the algebra, then delta Y is a section Y cross sub X. And it's basically the diagonal of morphism if we were just dealing in categories and final points. Category terms is a problem. So such a structure with a tree of objects, with sections for each object, and with operations as described, star, cross, and delta is a metagat algebra, providing the following axioms hold. And here's the six axioms, except these are very much abbreviated and a formal description has quite a bit more detail, just to clarify what's going on and the types of everything. But in these axioms, X and Y are objects, F and G are sections, and V is either an object or a section. I want to just be able to show you the axioms without going into full detail, which then sort of confuses things as much as qualifies them. So 
So compared to the theory of contextual categories, the theory of metagap does not introduce redundant structure. It axiomatizes the types and terms of the theory directly, and these correspond to the objects and sections of the corresponding contextual category. The theory of contextual categories, on the other hand, axiomatizes n tuples of terms for any n. It is these that are represented by the morphisms of the contextual category. The theory of Metagat is closely related to the notion of B system described by Fordham and to the algebras over the monad described by Richard Gold. In fact, the first time in modern times that I wrote up, uh, the first time I wrote the, uh, up Metagat algebras was when I uh, started communicating briefly with Radomir. Felt I had to write this down and share it with him at the time. Um, summarizing, the category of metagat algebras and the category of contextual categories are isomorphic. There is an isomorphism between the theory of contextual categories and the theory of metagat in the category of existentially and identity enriched generalized algebraic theories. There is no such isomorphism in the category of generalized. from which I deduce metagap algebras may have interpretations and therefore uses where contextual categories do not. Finally, very, very briefly, that description was talking about substitution was quite syntactic. Maybe it's possible to give a more abstract story of what these things are. So I'd like to very, very quickly give you a more abstract terminology. In which case we might say what we have is a concept instance algebra. There are concepts in each algebra. <laughs> Sorry, start that one again. There are concepts and each concept has a set of instances. There is a concept of the absolute. This concept has exactly one instance. Every concept except the absolute has a context which it depends on and which itself is a concept. Every concept is directly or indirectly dependent on the absolute. Two operations act on concepts and instances. Particularization denoted star and consideration denoted cross. F star X is the particularization of X to Y. X cross sub WY is a concept or instance Y considered in the context X constrained within the bounding context of Y. If Y depends directly or indirectly on X, then we say that X, Y is within X. We also say that an instance G of a concept Y is within X, provided that concept Y is within X. Therefore, every concept and instance is either the absolute or is within the absolute. Therefore, the absolute is also the whole. It is the concept of the whole of everything, which is a very good place to finish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? I have a comment, if I may. Yes, please. Um, just regarding the question from Jonathan Sterling about the adjoints to the um, generalized algebraic functors. I believe this should follow from considering the generalized algebraic theories as essentially algebraic theories by freely adding the finite limits that don't already exist. And then the, the induced functors between the locally presentable categories are going to have adjoints. So I, I don't think it's an open problem. I think it, it follows from the theory of locally presentable categories. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. Thanks for the interesting talk. I also have a comment. So John, you asked about the, uh, the theory of data where you were uh, 
using category theoretic ideas to model um, data in the style of relational databases. So there's been some work done there uh, by David Spivak. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar? So, so that's one. And then there's also previous, I think earlier than that is Robin Cockett and his co-workers. I've not seen that. No, I've not seen okay. that. Okay, so I'll, I'll drop you an email with some references no, and good. have a look. I think it's very much in the same spirit um, of, of, of using the technology and the, the methodology of category theory to put some sense into databases. Yeah. The, um, yeah, the, I, I, I don't look to um, describe data in the style of relational data theory. I looked for something more abstract that can be transformed into relational model. So I might be being a bit picky there, but yeah, thanks, Andre. <laughs> One more question, Steve. Thanks. Hi, John. Nice to hello, meet you. Hello, Steve. Yeah. I'm glad you're yeah. <laughs> Nice to put a face to, <laughs> to my name. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, some possibly related work by a young fellow uh, named Chaitanya Subramanian, who's uh, working lately on uh, representations of generalized algebraic theories and contextual categories as monads on various Rishi. Um, 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 so it sounds kind of close to the sort of yeah. thing you're talking about at least from the more abstract point of view. Um, I'll put his website. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. In the chat, but just email me if, if the chat disappears later. And okay. I'll you. He's a, quite a bright young fellow. He did a PhD with Paul-Andre Melies in Paris, and he's going to be a postdoc with Mike Schulman. Uh, right, yeah. Next year. yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, sure. Nice, nice stuff though. Glad to hear it, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Are there any further questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again and we will move on to the next one. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. <laughs> All right. Um, let's um, immediately continue with uh, Benedict. And then after Benedict's talk, have, uh, let's have a short break. Um, Benedict, are you here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Just to check my grades. <laughs> Good. Doing the <laughs> final preparations to everything, I was just um, getting a stand for my laptop. Uh, okay. the, word um, here, the word here has acquired a new meaning, I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah here here can here. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, here means with us. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here with you. Uh, let me just see how I can share my screen. Okay, uh, I've now attempted to share my screen. Can you see slides that say the role of C and B systems? We can see it. Um, okay, perfect. Um, should I start? Uh, yeah, let me introduce you. Uh, next up is uh, Benedict Ahrens from the University of Birmingham on the role of C and B systems in Poliwatsky's program on type theory. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Egbert, for inviting uh, me on for organizing this this day today, and and thank you for overview um, on on contextual categories and, and related stuff. Um, so the purpose of of this talk uh, is to give a high level overview of uh, how Wawatsky wanted to produce initial models of type theory. Um, I will just give uh, sort of the, uh, a roadmap and I will not give any definitions or, or proofs. You know? and so this is uh, just an, an overview and maybe uh, um, can be an entry point for you to look into um, Vladimir's literature, to Vladimir's um, articles and work uh, in more detail later. Um, I will try to explain what I understood very briefly 
from uh, Vladimir's ideas. Um, there's nothing uh, that I have done here. Well, uh, all the errors that have been introduced, uh, that's my only contribution to this. Otherwise, it's all uh, Vladimir's ideas. Okay. So, um, in, in Vladimir's paper on C systems from a module over a JF relative monad, Vladimir starts out by saying, the first few steps in all approaches to the set theoretic semantics of dependent type theories remain insufficiently understood. And it was his goal to um, remedy this lack of understanding. Um, the criticism that he makes in this paper is that by uh, currently, the current state of affairs is that um, reasoning about type theories um, is, is done currently by um, analogy. We have understood very well, and we have proof theorems about particular type theories, and we apply them by analogy to other type theories. And this is um, not acceptable, Vladimir says, and instead um, we should do reasoning about type theory by specialization of general results and theorems. So his goal was to, um, well, prove such general theorems. Um, in particular, to, to prove general theorems um, about type theories, one needs to build a connection between type theories on the one hand and abstract mathematical concepts um, that we want to discuss using type theory on the other hand. And this, uh, Vladimir uh, found the notion of C-system or contextual category essential for this purpose. Um, of building this connection. So he gave the following definition. He defines um, a C system model, or just a model for short, um, as a C system equipped with extra operations corresponding to the inference rules of some type theory. Okay. Yeah, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time, by the way. Uh, I will try to answer your questions. Um, okay. And then, so how, how do we, uh, how can we understand semantics of type theory? Well, the goal is to build two C system models, one from the formulas of some type theory and one from a category of abstract mathematical objects. For instance, uh, 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 simplicial sets or, or, or Kahn complexes or something. And then we want to construct an interpretation which Vladimir define, uh, defines uh, or suggests that any functor from the first to the second uh, category of from the any functor between the underlying categories of these two models uh, can be called an interpretation um, of the type theory into these abstract mathematical objects. Um, now the question is how can we build such an interpretation and uh, uh, one way to build such an interpretation is to show firstly that the term model is initial in a suitable category in the category of models. And then any model automatically yields a unique interpretation from the term model. So this is known as um, yeah, initiality. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's a concept that is very well studied in, uh, well, for simpler kinds of programming languages and has been shown uh, this initiality property here, number one, uh, has been shown for some particular type theories. And Vladimir's goal was to show it for a whole class of type theories. Um, and of course, so this um, in, in initiality, a, a model morphism is in particular an interpretation um, of the type theory in, in, any, in any other model. Okay, so, uh, if, sorry, if I go quickly back. so. Uh, Vladimir saw his task as building in particular two, uh, two models, uh, one from the formulas and one sort of mathematical model from abstract mathematical objects. Um, I will not discuss much the second point of construction of a semantic model. Um, uh, Vladimir had some uh, ideas here and provided uh, uh, several constructions of C systems and uh, from, from what he calls universe categories. I think universe categories are a notion that he introduced. And there were, he also has a few, uh, uh, one construction of um, 
C systems from CWFs. So um, he sees sort of C systems as a, uh, um, a strict and stratified version of the CWFs. But that's not the main topic. Uh, the main topic um, uh, of this uh, short presentation is the construction of term models. And here's an, an overview of the whole setup that uh, Vladimir constructed to construct term models of type theories. Um, and, and yeah, there are these five steps that I will try to um, talk a little bit more about in the, in, in the following, but this is sort of the, the, the overview of this tool chain. Um, the starting point for such a construction of a term model is um, a restricted two-sorted binding signature um, with, with two sorts. And there should be a space here between term and end. So this should be, a, a, the starting point is a, is a two-sorted binding signature, which is a, a very well understood notion with sorts term and type. And any such binding, it, it's restricted in the sense that there is no um, variable binding for variables, uh, for type variables, but there's only variable binding for uh, term variables. This is this restriction that um, is referred to here. Otherwise, it's just a two-sorted binding signature. You will see an example of a two-sorted binding signature in just a second. And uh, from such a binding signature, Vladimir constructs a monad R, which is a the uh, sort of the, the monad of terms associating to a set of variables, um, the set of terms are uh, using those or potentially using those variables. And he constructs a module, a left module LM over this monad R, which is the module of types. So associating to a set of variables, the set of types using uh, potentially these variables. And the LM, so LM is a module over R and the left, the action of this left module um, on the monad R can be thought of as the substitution of a, of a term in R um, for a variable in the type expression in LM. Okay, um, okay. From, from this pair uh, R and LM, so first, of all, Vladimir constructs a C system CR from R, which corresponds to, well, the untyped syntax uh, just spent by the terms of R. And then there is what Vladimir calls the pre-sheaf extension of a, um, of a C system. If one has a pre-sheaf on the category underlying a C system, one can construct a new, um, a new C system that is, uh, it's, equivalent as a C system, or it, it, it is often equivalent as a C system to the original C system, but it's not isomorphic to the original C system. So as, and uh, since C systems are structures that are um, not invariant under equivalence, but only under isomorphism, as C systems, they are very different, even though the underlying uh, categories and the, 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 the C systems are equivalent. Um, they are very different as C systems. In particular, this new C system here, CRLM constructed from CR, can have many more sub C systems. Okay, and the last step in his tool chain is um, to build sub C systems. Sorry, sorry, I should uh, say something more to, to point four. So, point f so I, sa I said that the C system CR built from R it's just a C system of, of, term, uh, of term syntax. Yeah, it's, it's untyped. There are no types involved yet because all the types are in, are in LM. And CRLM is then a C system of terms and types, but actually not of terms and types because uh, there's no typing relation yet. So it's a C system of pre-types and pre-terms where we have all the, all the types essentially, even ill-formed types. So this, we call them pre-types and similarly pre-terms. And then in the last step, um, uh, Vladimir considers sub-C systems and quotients for types and terms. So this is where 
uh, the sub-C systems are to filter out uh, um, ill-formed pre-types and pre-terms and the quotients are to integrate um, conversion rules. And so uh, Vladimir has a, 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 um, a theory to form sub-C systems and, and quotients of, of C systems uh, in a suitable sense to uh, go from pre-types and pre-terms to types and terms. Okay, uh, I will now give a few more details to uh, some of these points. And I repeat my invitation to you to ask any questions that you have. Okay, um, I would like to start with, so the first point, um, which were two sorted grammars or two sorted um, binding signatures um, and how to build a monad and a module from this. So here I have taken a small example of a, um, uh, from uh, Thomas Streich's uh, work on semantics of type theory. So this is a signature or a grammar if you want for a, for, uh, a calculus of constructions. And then we have uh, two sorts. So we have, the, we have the types here and we have the terms here and we have a few type constructors and a few term constructors here and the details are not important. What is important is that from such a signature, we can form a monad, which takes as input two sets, namely a set of variables for types and a set of variables for terms and returns, well, the types in that context, so X and Y here is context. And it, um, this monad T returns the types and the terms in the context X, Y. And from there, um, in, uh, in, in the paper um, C system from a module over a JF relative monad, Vladimir constructs um, a monad R, which is sort of the term monad and a module LM over R. And as I've said before, the module action of LM, you should think of as substitution of a term expression in a type expression. And then, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. If I understood you correctly, you said that type formers are restricted, so they don't have any binding. But now the pi has a bind is binding is it has a binder. So, so uh, are we allowing binders or we're we not allowing binders? Um, oh, I think yeah. But here's uh, so what is being bound here? I think it's a it's a term variable that is bound. Here. Oh, okay. So if you bind anything, it needs to be a term that you bind. You can't bind the types. That to say. You can't yes, abstract exactly. over types. You're not going to get system F out of this. Uh, exactly. Yes, okay. exactly. You have no binding of type variables. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yeah. So uh, I, I'm being very, very, very brief here because I don't have much time. And uh, I, I just give a, a rough overview, right? So if you don't, if you don't understand uh, the technical details is because I don't explain them. Um, okay, so now we have these, we have these, um, these, this monad R and the module LM over R. Let me describe the C system CR of a monad uh, very briefly. So the objects of this uh, C system CR, um, of the, the object of the underlying category are just natural numbers. So we think of them as untyped contexts. And the morphisms from M to N are maps from, so it's the opposite category here of the Gleisley category. So the, the morphisms from M to N are maps from uh, the standard finite sets on N to R on the standard finite maps, maps on M. Um, as I said, the category is hence the, the opposite of the Gleisley category on R. And the operation of pullback um, I'm not giving the details here, but it's sort of extending such a substitution map F from N to RM by, uh, uh, by extending it to, to um, a larger um, domain by using a variable in just a plain variable in RM plus one. So um, pullback is, is just um, on objects, it's just adding, adding uh, one to, to, the, to, the, to the source. So, what is important is that this C system, it corresponds to monotype syntax or untyped syntax uh, of just the terms. The, the type uh, 
the types of the of the of the generated by the two sorted binding signature do not play a role yet here. But this is coming in in what Vladimir calls the pre-shift extension of a C system. So if we have a C system C, and here I'm a bit sloppy with the notation. So C is a pre, is a C system, but also the underlying category also called C. So if we have a pre-shift F on, on C, then we can define a new C system called C uh, brackets F, where the objects are pairs of an object X here from C, from the original um, category or the original uh, C system, and then a sequence of elements in F going from F1, where one is the terminal object in, uh, in C, to F of the father of X. Um, the, the morphisms, however, are the same as in C. So to the morphisms from X something to Y something are just morphisms from X to Y in C. And uh, uh, similarly, the length function is just induced by C. And the pullback, I'm not going into the details, is, uh, uses the functorial action on F um, to, to extend an object. So what is here is important is that we have a fully faithful uh, uh, functor or uh, a C system homomorphism from CF to C. Um, if F of one is the empty set, so if we have this corresponds to a situation uh, that we have no, no, um, no terms at all, um, no, no, no base, sorry, no types at all, then this C system CF is, uh, is sort of is the one point C system is trivial. And otherwise, if we have, um, uh, uh, if we have non if you have proper types in, in F1, say, then any, any such type induces a functor from C to CF, so in the opposite direction, um, which is a C system homomorphism and is an equivalence of C systems. But importantly, it's not an isomorphism of C systems. So I C systems, C and CF are very different. Um, yeah, so this is a bit abstract. Let me try to describe the particular case of the pre sheaf extension of CR by a um, by a left um, module over R. Why does this work? How does it fit to what I've said on the slide before? Well, a module LM on R is the same thing as a functor on the Kleisley category of R. So recall that the category underlying CR is the opposite of um, the Kleisley category on R. So, so um, a, 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 what did I want to say? So a, yeah, the module LM is exactly a pre sheaf on the Kleisley category on R. So it fits exactly um, into this, this data here. And so we can compute, uh, we can build and compute CR of LM. So the contexts are sequences of types with suitable a number of, um, of, of variables uh, in these types, in these type expressions. Um, and pullback is substitution of terms in type expressions. And what is important is that this is, as I said before, this um, uh, uh, C system CRLM is a C system of pre types and pre terms. So we do have types and terms and they are arranged in the appropriate way, but we have no typing relation established yet between the types and the terms. So it's just pre types and pre terms. Um, and the question is now, how do we go from to types and terms, so uh, filtering out um, non, um, uh, it, it, filtering out ill-formed uh, pre-types and pre-terms. Well, we need something like sub-C systems for uh, filtering these guys out and quotients of C systems for the conversion rules. And this is where um, the B systems come into play that um, uh, much of the, the discussion later by Page and uh, Jacopo and uh, Egbert will be about. So if we look at the CRLM, this uh, uh, C system, um, we, we, it, it provides sort of the, the, uh, the syntax that we need to formulate judgments. So a, a statement, uh, gamma is a well-formed context, 
that's an element of, of this set here, BRLM, uh, which is just uh, strings of type expressions. Uh, and here, this, these, are the, these are the variables that can occur. So we have a string or a sequence of type expressions with an increasing number of um, free variables in there. And a statement uh, of the form gamma uh, uh, entails that T is a term of type capital T. That's an element of this set of B tilde R of LM, uh, which, um, uh, so what are the elements of this set? Well, it's uh, sequences of, but so this is, think of this as a context here of length, um, uh, is it N or N minus one? Um, and this is a, a term expression. And then we have another type expression, okay? So, um, yeah, what I mean to show here is that these sets uh, that we define from the C system, CRLM, uh, are sufficient to express uh, well-formedness of contexts and, um, and uh, typing judgments for terms. And in addition, uh, Vladimir identifies eight operations on B and B tilde that correspond to structural rules of a type theory. Details will follow in a, in a subsequent talk. So more abstractly, if we go away from the particular C system C of R generated by a module and, and a monad. So if we have a general C system C, Vladimir um, calls, um, defines set, uh, sets BC and B tilde of C, what he calls the B set, so the, the B system associated to C. And then uh, Vladimir constructed a bijection, and this is the important um, result, between sub C systems of a given C system and subsets of this, uh, of these, uh, of this pair of sets B, oh, there should be a C here, B of C and B tilde of C that are closed under the eight operations. And a similar, here's a more similar, a similar, but a more complicated result for quotients of, of C systems in a suitable sense and quotients of, of these B sets in a suitable sense. So um, this here is my understanding. This is, um, Vladimir is not very explicit about this, but this is down here. My interpretation is that these B sets and B systems, they are, and, and their subsets in particular and, and, sub, and, and quotients, they are similar in spirit to groups and their subgroups or more generally, uh, I think the idea, Vladimir's idea is to use this, these B systems, um, uh, they are much closer to, to universal algebra. Yeah, um, they're really, uh, they can be studied with methods that are uh, coming from universal algebra, uh, very similar in style to those to study um, subgroups and quotients of groups. And uh, Vladimir says that here a little bit, um, B systems are algebras or models of an essentially algebraic theory that is expected to be constructively equivalent to the essentially algebraic theory of C systems, which is in turn constructively equivalent to the theory of contextual categories. The theory of B systems is closer in its form to the structures directly modeled by context and typing judgments of dependent type theories. This is what I tried to um, explain to you. And further away from categories than contextual categories and C systems. Um, right, so it's it really, uh, these B systems, they are very directly inspired by um, just looking at, uh, at judgments of type theory, the tr traditional way of presenting a type theory. And in his um, Templeton grant uh, application, uh, Vladimir writes, the theory of B systems is contractually equivalent to the theory of C systems that were introduced by John Cardmel. Uh, proving this equivalence is among the first goals of the proposed research. Okay, so this is everything I want to say. Um, and I think more on B systems, the technicalities will come in a later talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benedict. Um, are there any questions? Um, Benedict, do you have any idea what an example of a useful general theorem would be that would yield lots of 
specializations that are useful, specializing to particular type theories? Well, I think it would start with a definition of uh, a notion of signature. And uh, I'm, th there have been a few definitions of signature. I think Vladimir has not given uh, a definition of signature himself, but uh, a general theorem would say, uh, so def first definition, this is uh, a signature, and then a theorem would say for any, um, it, it wouldn't be a, a theorem, maybe it would be a construction um, that would say how to construct an initial model uh, in any, for any signature. Thank you. Steve? In the first uh, quote there on your slide, it talks about theories being equivalent, even constructively equivalent. Mm -hmm. Is the notion of equivalence of theories of different kinds that's being used there? Is it that the categories of algebras are equivalent? Is it a kind of Morita equivalence? What is the notion of equivalence at work there? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer. Um, uh, for the, a naive answer um, could of course be that, uh, and this is um, work that we've been trying to do, that we were, were actively working on, uh, is to show that uh, a category of, of B systems uh, is equivalent to a category of C systems. So it would be constructing an equivalence of categories. But um, there are other notions of, of equivalence that you suggest that might be more useful um, for the purpose of um, for the purpose of, of, of studying initial semantics, um, and in particular, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what. Um, sorry, I forgot. I lost my um, train of thought. There could be other notions of, of equivalence that are more useful than this one. So I'm not sure. And Vladimir does not, I think, give, or I haven't, I'm not aware of any um, explanation that Vladimir gives for this uh, notion of equivalence. Could I just chip in with something there? Because mm -hmm. the question that Steve just asked seems to be, um, I, I seem to be talking about that in the little section that I had on fungible. And it seems to me that, and, and to take your answer as well, Benedict. So you talked about the category of algebras being, did you say isomorphic or equivalent? I can't remember now. Um, uh, so I talked about isomorphism and equivalence uh, between two different C systems. Yeah. So, so the question was, what would two theories, what would it mean for two theories to be equivalent? And one possible answer would be that the category of algebras were either isomorphic or equivalent. And, and then oh. if you say that they're constructively equivalent, then that isomorphism has to be reasonably straightforward. And that means you can probably describe it by fairly straightforward type constructors. And then that mm -hmm. means that the theories are isomorphic uh, within a category of theories where the morphisms include the ability to use those type constructors. That makes sense. It seemed to be what I was talking about in, when I discussed, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think there was a section of fungibility. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, I agree. It's, it's very much related. Um, uh, I must admit that I don't know what the word fungible means. So uh, I, I was puzzled by this. Well, in, maybe you uh, can think of it as equivalent, but in a non-technical sense. Ah, okay. Right. It, apparently it's a legal term. Tins of beans are fungible because uh, if you buy one, you can get any tin and they're sort of equivalent. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so exactly. You mentioned, I think, also, and and uh, so you mentioned B systems. I forgot the name that you used for B systems. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you also mentioned uh, that they would be equivalent. Yeah. And um, maybe Vladimir was uh, inspired for by for to. Um, no, oh, I'm sure he, his piece systems. No, no, uh, he, 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 he knew. <laughs> yeah. I think Steve had one last question before we're going into the break. Well, I was just going to suggest, I mean, one could imagine the equivalence of categories between the categories of algebras, which is induced by a sort of syntactic translation, which would be represented by some sort of functor on the initial between the initial algebras of the two different theories, that would be a kind of Morita equivalence. But one could also imagine more liberal one arising from a functor from the initial algebra of one theory into something like the pre sheaves or the algebras of the other theory. So like a more general construction. Like you have, I mean, thinking of maps between pre sheaf toposes that arise either by precomposition with a functor between the two index categories, or maybe more generally by a con extension of a functor from one index category to the other category of pre -sheets. And then that functor might have to be, you know, finitary or something. So there are all different ways of comparing two such categories of algebras. So I think it's an interesting question, but it could be fleshed out. So I just wanted to mention that idea. Okay, thank you. Um, I think yeah, it's time for, for a break. Um, we are running over time. So let's uh, come back at uh, 16.45 in seven or eight minutes. And I see two people have raised their hands, so maybe they can catch Benedict and still ask their, um, their questions, but, but we also need a break. So we- I will be here. Yeah. In seven minutes. Just to follow up on that discussion that we just had, uh, if you're sticking around, Benedict. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. in, the, in the quote by Voivodsky, uh, he says, uh, he mentions the essentially algebraic theory specifically of these various constructs. Does that not suggest that the theory of equivalence is either equivalence of models or equivalence of theories as finitely complete categories? Because in the case of essentially algebraic theories, Marita equivalence is the same as equivalent. So it seems like to me like there's only one good notion of equivalence in this setting. Is there another that is stronger or possibly weaker that you can think of? Um, well, the one that we've been uh, looking at is just equivalence as uh, categories. So um, I'm not sure. So, so this is the category of B systems the and the category of C systems, for instance. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. This, this should be the same as uh, an equivalence of the finitely complete categories presenting the categories of B systems and of C systems, because they're both essentially algebraic. So presumably that that matches the notion of equivalence that you're intuitively going for? Uh, could be, but um, I, I'm not sure, yeah. Um, if I may say, say something on that. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, sorry, who asked the question? Nathaniel. Uh, Hi, Nathaniel. So I think what you suggested is um, the So there is a notion of equivalence of theories as categories and the equivalence of categories of models, and I, which are equivalent in the finite limit case, as you correctly point out. But I don't think they are equivalent in the, um, 
in the more general case. Um, in the so I I have thought about this in slightly different terms in terms of uh, display map categories or uh, Joyal's clans. And there are, you, for example, you can have many different clans that represent the theory of categories. That, does this uh, relate to your question or am I getting it wrong? Yeah, so I, I, I guess the question maybe is when does equivalence of theories coincide with Maritra equivalence, i.e. equivalence of the algebras? And for finite limit theories, they're the same. And then the question here is maybe whether Maritra equivalence coincides with equivalence of theories for something like generalized algebraic theories, which uh, I guess is the point of C systems and B systems. It's all about um, generalized algebraic theories. But I imagine in this case, the Maritra equivalent should coincide again because generalized algebraic theories can essentially be treated as essential algebraic theories. But is there a weaker notion of theory that is being considered here than generalized algebraic theory? So, okay. If you have a, a Lavier theory, a Lavier theory can be strictified to a, to a kind of C system or CWF. And the associated uh, essential uh, Lex completion or the finite limit theory can also be strictified to a CWF or a C system. And these two will be different, I think. even though they have the same categories of models. Could, could you uh, repeat the example one more time? Sorry, I didn't quite catch it. Take an arbitrary Lavier theory, um, Lavier theory of groups, let's say. And then you have the, the Lavier theory is the category of contexts of a CWF where the display maps or the context projections are precisely the Pro, uh, the product projections. Um, and so this is a, and the models of this is the category of groups. And then you can take the completion of the same theory to a finite limit theory. So that's, that will be not the category of, so, okay, let's say the Lavier theory is the category of finitely presented free groups opposite. The finite limit theory has this underlying category, the category of all finitely presented groups. And so I think these will be the underlying categories of contexts also of dependent theories, um, which are non-equivalent, but have equivalent models. Does it make sense? Yeah, this makes sense. Maybe one, one last comment from me. Um, the reason why uh, maybe a, an equivalence of just categories between C and B systems is useful is because um, we can transfer initial objects uh, via this equivalence of categories. So I think that um, just very naively, if, uh, if we can construct an initial object an initial b system say we, we define b systems we should define that in addition to the c system models of um of a type theory we define the b system models of a type theory uh, then we can simply transfer uh, and we can construct uh, an initial b system model then i think um yeah then we get an initial uh C system model, which is what Vladimir wanted, uh, just by transfer. Suppose I mean, uh, assuming that the type constructions are compatible with this equivalence between B and C systems. And I suspect, but I'm not sure, that this is um, how Vladimir wanted to use this equivalence. So maybe a, a, a simple equivalence of the categories of B and C systems is what he wanted for his construction of initial C systems. Okay. I think we are uh, getting back. So maybe, um, Paige, are you ready for? Ah, yes. Yes.
Great. Um, Let's maybe wait one more minute for Steve. Cool. Okay, so the uh, next speaker is Paige Nord from the University of Pennsylvania. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for inviting me and for having this great um, seminar. So I will just be talking about um, the definitions of fee systems, which we've heard a bit about already, and also e systems um, in detail. So uh, there's quite a bit more here than I have time for. So um, a lot of the, the things I will gloss over, but they're written on the slides in case people have questions. Okay, so um, just to define um, B system, uh, we first want to talk about um, B frames. So a B frame is just a diagram in the category of sets. Um, so of sets and functions of this, this form here. So we have um, uh, the set that must be um, a singleton, and we have the set B1 and a map, um, the, all these uh, father maps, FT stands for father, and these um, boundary maps here. Um, so this is just an arbitrary um, diagram of sets, but as um, especially Benedict kind of hinted at, we want to think, so I'm not gonna be talking about the whole monad story, but we just want to think um, intuitively if we're using the Easton model um, type theory of each of the BNs um, as a set of context of length N. So in particular, um, the elements of BN, we are kind of imagining as um, judgments like this. And then uh, these BN tildes as the set of terms um, here in, in one of these contexts and in one of these, these types. Um, and then the, these father maps just reduce the length of the context by one, just throwing away the last guy. And these um, boundary maps just forget about um, the term. Okay, so um, we're also going to be using slices of B frames in order to define some, some of the concepts. So if we have um, a particular uh, element of a particular one of these, these BNs, then we can define um, the slice B frame with respect to that guy X, which uh, looks a little bit complicated, but it's very straightforward. So um, at the bottom here, the singleton we have uh, is just X itself. And then we take um, kind of the, the pre-image of X all the way up. So here we just take all of the the guys um, in the pre-image of X under one of these maps. And then here we take the guys in the pre-image um, of that set under the father map. And here we take all of the guys in the N tilde um, in the pre-image of the, uh, the boundary map. Um, and so if we're thinking of this B frame as giving to us um, some of the data of a dependent type theory, then X is some, some context, and these guys are um, contexts who's, who have like an initial segment of the original context X, and these guys are all the, the terms in our context X, and these guys are terms in a context with an initial segment um, that is X. Okay. Um, all right, so now um, with the basic concept of B frame in place, we can define um, a pre-B system. So we'll quickly, um, quite a few steps to get all the way to a B system. Um, so a pre-B system consists of a bunch of operations that represent the basic operations that we need in a type theory. Um, so the first one is this um, guy, WX. 
And so it's a B-frame homomorphism from this slice B-frame to this slice B-frame. And I didn't explicitly define um, B-frame homomorphisms, but it's just um, a natural transformation of, of uh, two of these, these diagrams. Um, so to understand what's going on here, if we um, imagine that this B-frame is a collection of, of contexts and terms, um, then what's happening here is that if we have um, a guy in this B frame, uh, say in just a, just a, an X here that's um, uh, in like the B1, the, not the bottom uh, set, but one set above. So if we have an X, a context like this, um, just an arbitrary one, um, that is this X. And then we imagine um, a guy Y, um, just in the, the B1 of this set, of this B frame. So that's a, a type Y in this um, initial part of our, our X, just peeling off the XN. Then um, we should have this, um, this homomorphism weakening that allows us to um, remember that we can view Y in this uh, extended context, putting xn back in and, and an arbitrary uh, variable of xn. Um, okay, so this um, big B frame homomorphism is representing this weakening operation that we certainly expect to be able to do um, with a dependent type theory. And we should also be able to um, do substitution. So uh, we formalize that in this, this setup like this. So we have um, uh, substitution is being represented also as a B-frame homomorphism um, of this shape, and it will make more sense probably to think about it um, in this particular with this particular intuition. So um, we have substitution for every uh, x in one of these B tildes. So if we say that uh, our guy little x looks like this, so it's some um, um, context here and some term in a type x n then um, one of the, the guys in here, particularly like one of the kind of lowest guys will um, look like this. So it would be, um, so we're in the, uh, uh, we're being, we're dependent on the boundary of this term judgment. So we've got in our context, um, all of these uh, types and then one extra one. So I'm again, thinking about um, an element of the, B1 part of this B frame. So if we have one of these guys, then we should certainly be able to substitute our um, term that we know about T in for this variable Xn um, in for Y. So we can certainly do that in dependent type theory. And that's what's being represented here by this B frame homomorphism. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? This is quite um, a load of, of technicality. Okay, so um, then we also have um, functions, so not a whole B-frame homomorphism, but just uh, functions delta from uh, Bn plus one to any uh, B tilde n plus two. Um, and we, want this, this relationship here between the boundary of this, this map and weakening. And again, it's really gonna make sense if we think about it with this intuition. So this represents, um, uh, I don't think there's like a standard word for this um, in the following part of this talk, I'm gonna call it projection, should have called it projection here, but you could say maybe the generic term or um, sometimes it's called the variable rule. So if we have um, a guy in, this set that we are imagining as a um, context of length n plus one, then we should be able to uh, duplicate this last part of the context um, and get a term um, in this context of length n plus two. We have n plus two um, types here now. And if you, we uh, just remove this term, so we take the boundary of this um, term, then we're left with uh, exactly what we get with uh, weakening. 
So that's why um, we have this, this requirement here. Okay, so um, a pre-B homomorphism, as you would expect, is just a B-frame homomorphism, so just uh, like a natural transformation between these uh, kinds of diagrams, which preserves weakening substitution and this um, delta projection map. Okay, so um, a B system now, uh, finally we can get here to a B system, is a pre-B system, so it's a B frame with all of these um, maps uh, for which we require uh, that a bunch of things commute. So we can wrap this up by saying um, that W and S, those B frame homomorphisms are required to themselves be pre-B homomorphisms, which means that they preserve um, weakening substitution and the projection map. And so I've written down here, not um, all of the diagrams that have to commute, but uh, some of them just to illustrate what's going on here. Um, so if we say that um, uh, weakening must preserve weakening, then what we mean is that um, we have this, this, this first diagram here. So if we have um, some uh, type, which is, I mean, of course, I'm taking two slices here. So just like with categories, I could have not written this, this slice explicitly. It just, just sliced over um, ft of y. But I'm, I'm writing this all um, to be more explicit. So if we have a, um, a say, imagining um, these guys as, as context. So if we have a context, who um, has some, I guess I've written it out here, so let me use this. So if we have a context that has some um, initial part uh, of a context X, so some guy like X1 and X1 through X um, N minus one and X N minus one. And then we've got also dependent on that, some other context Y, so we can kind of extend the thing of this context is being extended by a bunch of types y, and we have some um, context in like the the first set in this this B frame. It would look like like this whole thing if we're thinking of it um, as a context. Uh, if we weaken by y here, so there's um, in the data here. I haven't written it down explicitly. There's um, a y m and an xn um, that, we, that we know about. So if we weaken by y, which is to say that we put in ym here, and then we weaken by x, which is to say that we um, insert an xn here, uh, doing that in either order will give us the same result. That's what we mean by weakening, commutes with weakening. Um, and similarly, we want uh, substitution to preserve weakening. So again, uh, if we just think about this with um, our dependent type theory intuition, um, if we have a judgment like this, um, we can perhaps weaken by a type ym, just inserting it in there, or substituting in a term uh, t that we might know about um, into xn. And these two things give the same result in either order, I guess with the caveat that um, if we uh, weaken by ym, we are going to weaken with the ym with t already substituted into it if we do that after um, substitution. Okay, and then we also want um, weakening to preserve this delta, this projection um, function. So um, what this looks like if we again use our intuition about dependent type theory is that if we are doing this um, for some context x here. Um, and if we uh, look at an extended context like this with some y's, if we um, weaken by some type xm, so we insert it in here, or if we form the generic element of y n plus one um, by weakening by y n plus one and then um, seeing the generic term here then we get the, the same result, no matter which order we do these, these two things in. Okay, and there are some dots here because 
there are several other diagrams that I haven't written down, but I think hopefully you get the idea that just doing substitution, um, weakening, or this generic element operation um, in any order gives us the same, the same result. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, so um, given this um, whole bunch of data, we can uh, easily construct a category in a, in a very straightforward way. So maybe this will be less um, technical and more understandable, especially for category theorists. So if we just remember um, this part of the B system, so there were these like other guys off here that were representing the terms, but if we just uh, remember uh, the context, um, this is exactly a rooted tree um, or, or one uh, formulation of what a rooted tree is. So we can take the category freely generated by this rooted tree, just um, thinking of the rooted tree as a graph. So as you normally do when you take a category freely generated by a graph. And um, so to be explicit, uh, the objects are the objects of this uh, new category are just the disjoint union of all the BNs. So we have this, this guy, which, which will turn out to be the terminal object, all the elements of this guy, all the elements of this guy, all unioned up. Um, and then the morphisms are, as we normally do when we really generate um, a category from a graph, they're just formal composites of um, morphisms of this form. So I'm writing the objects of this um, category as tuples of the, the natural number that's, that's indexing the set that they came from and um, an element of the set. So given um, an object of the category, let's say n plus one comma x, um, we get a unique morphism that goes to um, n. So we're just going kind of we're looking at x in this guy and we're putting into the category just one morphism um, that points to uh, its father, you might say. So uh, we have a unique morphism to the object, which is n and the father of x. Um, and so since the uh, elements of these sets we're thinking of as context, um, this category we can think of as a category of context with uh, projections and, and uh, well, father maps and uh, composites of the, the father maps. Okay, um, so we always get this, this category from a B system. And of course, as I said, we are forgetting all of the, those B tildes that are giving us the, what we're imagining as the terms. Um, so if we remember this, this structure, then what does that give us? Like, how can we kind of add that to this new category that we've gotten? Um, what we get here is uh, a set uh, of all of the, the terms basically in the context X for every object of our category. So we, the category comes with this um, bunch of, of sets for every object. And um, of course, we um, a lot of diagrams describing the substitution, um, B-frame homomorphism, the weakening, um, and the projection structure, that delta. And so when we um, form this category and all of these sets, we get um, also structure from, from this if we're starting with a P system. Okay, so the question then is to um, categorize or uh, characterize the structure that we get on the other end when we take this um, category, like freely generated category construction on a B system. And so what we get are stratified B systems, we're calling them. And um, indeed the category of B systems is equivalent to the category of stratified E systems. So um, I think I've already been talking for 20 minutes. So in the last few minutes, I will uh, give a brief um, overview of what stratified means and what E-systems uh, mean. 
Okay, so um, stratification, um, I think um, John talked about it in the beginning. Uh, he used the, the phrase tree-like structure, I think, um, if I remember correctly. So I think that's probably um, the same as what's going on here. So a stratified category um, is one of the, the following guys, um, all of whom are equivalent. And I'm going into a bit of detail here because um, Jacopo will use, use this um, in his talk. So uh, a stratified category is a category with a terminal object and uh, a kind of length functor from our category into um, the natural numbers uh, oppositely ordered such that L preserves a terminal object. So it takes the terminal object to zero because zero is the, the first object in natural numbers. Um, each of the, uh, the fibers of this functor is a set and uh, every morphism um, in C has a unique factorization like this, um, all of whose morphisms uh, decrease the length by exactly one. So we can um, always kind of uh, factor um, a morphism through one of these maybe atomic maps. Okay, another way to um, define what a stratified category is, is uh, it's just a category in the image of the um, free construction that takes a rooted tree and gives you um, a free category as I just mentioned a few minutes ago. So in particular, any one of the, um, the categories that we get from a B system is stratified because we are using this functor to construct it. Um, and in particular, a corollary of this, the fact that this is equivalent or maybe an ingredient is um, that uh, for a category being stratified is not structure, it's a property. Um, and another way to see it is that um, it's a category with a terminal object one, and again, a function, but now, I mean, now a function, not a functor um, from the objects of C into the natural numbers, such that L um, preserves a terminal object, so it takes the terminal object of C to zero, and such that for every um, object of C, and natural number, the set of arrows that go from X to an object of length exactly K is one if K is less than or equal to the length of X itself. So there's exactly one, there's a unique arrow, I should say, um, if there's a unique arrow from X to a guy of length less than or equal to X for, for a particular length. And um, there are no arrows that go up um, in length. Okay, so what we see um, when we do this construction on B systems is um, stratified, stratified category, but it has a lot of extra structure on it. And that's captured by um, the notion of E systems. Um, and maybe I'll just take a few minutes to say very briefly what an E system is. So I don't go too much over time. Yeah, um, so present it, the definition, it's not the problem. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll just present my thing shorter. Okay. Um, so an E system um, consists of a category together with structure like weakening, substitution, and projection. Um, that is what we get um, by turning a B system into a category. So um, a weakening system, first of all, consists of a category F and um, a bunch of functors, uh, W sub F from uh, the slice curly F over Y to the size curly F over X for every um, morphism like this in F. So we can kind of think of it as generalizing um, the notion of pullback. So pullback would be um, one example of these. Um, such that the each of these WFs um, is functorial in F, meaning that if you put in the identity for F, you get the identity um, functor out. And if you uh, put in a composition, you can compose um, the two individual weakening functors, um, and also such that they preserve the terminal object. So if we look at the, um, the terminal object in a slice category, it's of course the identity morphism, say from Y to Y, so it takes identity to the identity, also just like um, pullback does, and such that they commute with each other. So this is very similar to um, what we said in, in the context of B systems with weakening have to, having to commute with weakening. Um, 
and maybe I won't I won't describe this in detail, but um, we require that this this diagram commute. So if we weaken by one guy H and one guy F in either order, um, should be the same. Okay, um, and so onto a weakening system, we can add a term structure, and so this represents um, what we get from the B tildes um, of a B frame. So a term structure um, for a weakening system consists of a set F for every um, function, or sorry, for every morphism of our category. And we get um, a morphism, a function of these sets um, for every uh, morphism of our category, every two morphisms of our category that take um, uh, the set uh, T of F, so um, terms over F, or maybe we can think more about X, the domain of F, um, into the terms of F weakened by G, um, which is what we, we should expect for type theory. Um, and then we also have a substitution structure, which under this functor is coming from the substitution functor of B systems. Um, so this consists of um, functors that go kind of in the other direction from weakening. So they go from um, a slice over X um, to a slice over Y for a morphism from X to Y. And uh, we also need a particular term um, over F to substitute um, along. Um, and then we also want this to interact nicely with the terms. So if we have um, a term of G, we should be able to turn that into a term of G with X substituted into it. Um, and then we require some coherence, I guess. So we require that uh, all these substitution functors preserve the terminal object and also that substitution commutes with itself, um, similar to what we saw for the B systems. Okay, then we also um, want to see a projection structure, which corresponds to that delta um, with the B systems. So a projection structure for a weakening system with term structure and substitution structure consists of um, these specified elements id tm of f in the terms of f weakened by f. So these are exactly those generic terms, these, these um, projections for every um, function in our category curly f. And um, not surprisingly, we want this to be preserved by weakening and substitution. Okay, and then we can with all this, um, this structure, we can finally um, define an E system so an E-system is all this stuff, a weakening system um, with a terminal object, and then with term structure, substitution structure, and projection structure, such that um, substitution and weakening commute, um, just like they do for B-systems. We also um, want some um, of these coherences with weakening and substitution. So if we, um, if we weaken by F, and then we substitute in a particular um, term, we should get the identity back. Um, if we substitute X into one of these generic terms, we should get X out. And if we weaken by F weakened by F and then substitute into the generic term, um, we should get identity out. Okay, so I think that concludes my talk. I've um, defined quite quickly um, a lot of structure. So B, the B systems, the E systems, and then in the middle um, said that these two guys, well, the B systems are equivalent to the stratified E systems. Okay, and that's it. Any questions? Nathaniel? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, these B systems look quite like the algebras that Richard Garner defines in his paper on generalized algebraic theories, like that the B frames look like the category on which pre sheaves are taken, and then the structure looks like the algebra structure. Are they strongly related? Are they the same thing? Or could you say something about that? Uh, yes, they are um, very closely related. I forget. Um, Maybe precisely what what the statement is. Um, do you know Egbert? Um, 
if I also forgot uh, Richard's definition, but if it is about dependent type theories, eventually it should be the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm now forgetting what I think. <laughs> They're, they're either equivalent or or he has just a little something, um, yeah. little extra thing that we're not considering. Yeah. Thanks. They, they are the same as what uh, Vladimir has, so. Yeah. John. Yeah, I guess, I guess um, uh, so I recognize pieces of this and then there's pieces that I don't quite follow. So I, I can't say that I fully understand it all, but What's the sort of motivation for defining these systems in this particular way with this sort of heavy amount of functoriality, if that's the way of saying? So, I mean, these, these, your commuting diagrams will turn out to be the axioms that I, as Egbert says, they're about the same thing. They're going to end up being the same. So are going to be those the equations that I have for B systems. Um, what do you think? Why do you think it's a good idea to to go this way with this sort of heavy amount of tutorial machinery? Um, is it all coming from the desire to machine check proofs and to code up in languages that we can then check mechanically is that where it's coming from um yeah so we want to relate um the b systems to the c systems so the e systems are kind of an intermediate yeah. um structure and yeah. Yakpo, i think we'll talk about the relationship between e systems and c systems um so that's where um it's coming from um uh, the fact that it's so categorical um is maybe um, I don't know, just because those are the tools that we we like to use. Yeah. Um, but uh, Egbert will talk about a formalization, at least of the, the B system um, things. Yeah, I can also say about the definition of E systems, where it comes from is we want to uh, have a more general notion of a context where we don't necessarily know that it's a list of variable declarations but it's just some some more yeah. ab abstract thing and the only thing you know about it is that you can um that you can get can concatenate the context like you can extend them and that extension when you are looking at it more abstractly it should be associative and um and when you extend with the empty context it's, that should be identity and so on so you see the loss of a category appearing already and that's that category F. And you see the category F also in, um, in a category with families or in, this, in a contextual category. It's just mm -hmm. a category that you um, obtain when you forget all the morphisms except the sure. composites of sure. projections. Sure. They're, the, they're sure. the composites of the projections. Yeah. So we wanted to just abstractly yeah. say what it is. And, um, yeah. and actually there's a notion related to E-system that Jacopo will present that's intermediate between E systems and C systems. <laughs> and it's C E systems. And, and that one's actually the simplest of all of them, I think. Right. So. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, when I first came to this, um, my first definition of what I'm now calling metagate algebra was actually, was, did involve lots of hierarchy of functors. And um, I called it a reflexive tree category. Um, for whatever reason, but then I sort of evolved to it being uh, defined more directly as a structure. Yeah, good, thank you. Are there any further questions? I, I had a question yeah. from earlier on, I just didn't get it in, and I was also driving around in a car, which I'm not sure somebody can answer quickly for me. So if I understood the th how things are built up correctly, in this setup, in Vladimir's setup in particular, you cannot have a term former that has equational premises. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. You can have those. Ah, uh, you can have those. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's it's very general system. You can. Um, yeah. So that comes in. So that comes in. 
at the level of B systems, right? Because the C, the C system that um, Benedict was describing, that's just raw pre-syntax. Mm -hmm. And so there you don't pay any attention to any premises, you just yeah. want. But then later on, you can, you can have the equation of premises. So uh, what you can have is any operation that, um, that uses any amount of terms and types and any equations with them as hypothesis and then produces either a term somewhere or a type somewhere or an equation between terms or an equation okay, between types. You. It can be that general, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, shall we move on? And then, um, I am going to share my screen. Um, I am going to do the thing that I was told not to do is to show code. <laughs> and um, the other thing I am going to do, if I can find the chat, uh, here it is. Oops. Um, I'll post the link to this code. So there it is in the chat. And I am going to present, um, let's see, what's the time? Ah, okay, Emacs, or my Zoom, okay, 17.22. Okay, I'm going to present the formalization of um, systems that are closely related to B systems, but it's not exactly that definition, but still um, it's intended to be that definition. Um, we want to uh, formalize, um, or first of all, this basic structure that um, B systems are uh, built around. And um, we called them B frames, but here for some reason I called them systems, <laughs> just short, but it's like this, um, this hierarchy of sets. I'm not really assuming that this is a singleton. Um, and then there's, uh, then there's these sets, A tilde, A0 tilde, A1 tilde, A2 tilde, and so on. Um, but, uh, but you quickly get into trouble in a formalization if you are going to rely on the natural numbers, if you're going to use pre-images and so on, and you use maps between sets. So what I do in the definition of system, I make a, a, a co-inductive definition. <clears throat> Instead of a sequence of sets, you can say, oh, we're going to co-inductively uh, generate a sequence of sets. And at the base level, uh, this type of uh, this should be the type of closed types in the system. That's uh, that this type A zero here, and uh, the elements of closed types that should be a family over um, over this base type here of closed types. That's going to be this, but now seen as a family. So that's um, um, as much as possible. We use the type dependency that's already around in ECDA. And then we simply say that for every closed type, we get a new system. And that's this way we generate the whole sequence co-inductively. <clears throat> uh, so uh, yeah, once I realized that this is a co-inductive definition, things got going uh, with the formalization because of course you get uh, stuck if you do things with natural numbers and then you have to show that n plus one is one plus n and you have to transport along equations and then you have to transport over those and so on. Uh, you want to avoid any equations at all. <clears throat> um, so this is what the B frames are. And then there's a definition of um, morphisms, uh, the home of systems. That's just, um, the type of functions from uh, from the closed types in A to the closed types in B. Um, then for every closed type in A, you get the elements of that closed type, and you have the elements in the um, in the uh, action on types of the homomorphisms. That's this. This is let's say f of x, but this is elements in B, and you want to map from here to there. And then uh, again, just to, uh, you uh, say co-inductively, we want uh, for every uh, closed type to get a morphism from the slice um, over X in A uh, to the slice um, over F of X in B. <clears throat> so this is what the, what the morphism is and uh, everything is generated co-inductively. Um, then um, 
Okay, so there is the identity morphism, you have to define it, so you have the uh, composition of morphisms. But to state the uh, axioms, we should say what's our, uh, when are two morphisms equal? And they are equal if we have a homotopy between them or a family of equalities. So we should say what that means. And um, let's go here. The a homotopy of morphisms of systems takes uh, two systems as an argument. Um, one system A, system B, and uh, two morphisms uh, between them, F and G from A to B, and it's some type. <clears throat> and the type is defined here. But the reason I, um, I went a longer way is that actually it's not possible to, <clears throat> to construct any homotopies if you, um, if you define this directly. And I first defined a heterogeneous um, notion of homotopies, where the, uh, the codomains of F and G don't match. And this turns out to, um, to help. So let's say what this heterogeneous notion of homotopies is. It again takes uh, the so domain system. Yes. Sorry, Evan. Could mm -hmm. you just just wind back one little minute? And how do yes. we get to homotopy? <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Is that? Uh, the... Yeah. So we want. So to... that is the subject of your talk. Yeah. Um, not necessarily. It's just no. uh, a homotopy is uh, as far as just a point, a family of identifications using the identity type of uh, Martin Love. Right. So now we're looking at how to enrich systems with yeah. more type formers. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, um, is that how yeah. we should think about it? Yeah. So we want, uh, we want uh, this substitution and weakening uh, operations on systems. Uh, those will be um, uh, morphisms, so they will have this, this kind of type. Uh, and there will be axioms, uh, namely that weakening right. preserves weakening and substitution preserves substitution. And those will be stated as pointwise equalities, because that's right. what, you, what you can say when you have functions involved. Thank you. Uh, so, sorry for the interruption. No, no, no. Thank you for the, for the question. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, so this was actually the hardest part of the formalization to recognize what is the right notion of homotopy. And uh, I take here a morphism F that goes from A to B and a morphism G that goes from A to B prime. And A and, uh, and B and B prime are equal with the identity type, but they are not, not the same. <clears throat> and um, using this data, I can define what is a homotopy. Um, so uh, how do you do that? You want to say that well, F and G are pointwise equal, but F lands in uh, B and uh, G lands in B prime, and we have an identification from B to B prime. So we can transport along that identification from B to B prime and ask, uh, are they now equal? So that's what happens here. And then you do uh, something similar on elements and, and on the slice. So I'm just going to skip over this um, because I want to get at the definition of, <clears throat> uh, of weakening now. Uh, it's just the idea is there pointwise equal with some transports involved. Uh, OK, so uh, dependent type theories, they, uh, uh, they have weakening and substitution, at least when you formulate it as a B system. Uh, so weakening, what is it? It's going to be um, structure on a system. And, um, and it says that for every type X, for every closed type, I should be able to weaken by that type. And weakening by that type is going to be a morphism from A to the slice in A over X. So this is uh, this puts everything in context X, and um, so here you see also that if I have something um, something in A that uh, that that maybe is itself dependent on a very long context in A, it will just be mapped to whatever weakening maps that context to. It preserves 
preserve that structure. But then you're not done because we cannot only weaken by closed types, we can also weaken by types in context. Um, and uh, so this just says for every closed type, we should also have weakening structure on the slice in A over X. So this first means that you can weaken by closed types in the slice, but then also because this goes uh, recursively, you can weaken by, uh, by later types, types that depend on more things. <clears throat> so this, uh, this is how you conductively say what weakening structure on a system is. And then you can also say, what does it mean for a morphism from A to B to preserve the weakening structure? So now you assume that A has weakening structure and B has weakening structure, and you have a morphism from A to B, then uh, what does it mean to preserve uh, the weakening structure? Well, first you have to preserve weakening by closed types. So you start with a closed type in A, then um, uh, uh, then some square should commute. And uh, this square says, uh, okay, I can first apply H and then we can in B using H of X. X is our closed type and H of X is then the closed type in B. Or I could do it, have done it the other way around. I can uh, first weaken in A by X, and then, uh, then I am in context X. So now I can apply the uh, slice uh, of H over X. And, uh, and those two things should be the same. So there should be a pointwise equality between those at the level of uh, types and at the level of terms. Um, okay, but the weakening structure has more than only weakening by, uh, by closed types. It also has uh, weakening by types in context and that's, uh, that's what's specified here. For any uh, closed type uh, X, you should, uh, um, we require that the uh, slice of the morphism over X preserves weakening on the slices. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so now we, we just know what it means to be, to preserve that structure. So the same goes for substitution. Uh, what does it mean to give substitution structure to a system A? Well, <clears throat> uh, first you can substitute by a closed element of a closed type. And uh, if X is a closed element of a closed type, then substitution takes type theory in context X to type theory. That's what it does. So it lowers the level of your type dependency. And, um, and uh, that's not all. You cannot only uh, substitute by closed elements of a closed type, um, but you can also uh, substitute by elements that do depend on a variable. So if it depends on a variable of type X, then you should have substitution structure on the slice in A over X. And again, you state what it means to preserve substitution. It's a similar condition, some square commutes. And the last uh, structure we add is the generic element on a system A. And you have to require um, weakening structure because uh, uh, it says that in context gamma, X and A, you have X and A. And here, this A, oops, is weakened, is the weakened uh, A by A. So you already have to have weakening before you can state what the generic element is. Uh, and um, so first you add the structure of um, generic elements of closed types. So given a closed type, um, we want uh, that there is an element in the slice over X because uh, now let's match this notation X. So now it's in type theory um, dependent over X. Um, we want uh, to give an element of the um, uh, X weakened by itself. So this is the X, this is what it's weakened by. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, <clears throat> this, is uh, this X here. And then 
uh, not only close types have generic elements, but uh, also types and contexts have close elements. So that's this condition here. And again, you state a, a condition. What does it mean to preserve the generic element? That's just some, um, some equation again. Uh, and then the last part is um, how do you state the axioms that these operations should satisfy? Um, so we saw them already uh, in Pages talk. So weakening should preserve weakening. Weakening should preserve substitution. It should preserve the generic element. It's, uh, then substitution should preserve weakening, substitution, and the generic element. And, uh, and there are a few more laws. So we will now formalize them. But the, um, in the case for weakening, the rule is this, given a type A in context gamma, given a type B in a longer context than gamma, and given a type C in an even longer context, then I can weaken um, F, uh, B by A, but then I also have to weaken this whole context by A, and I can weaken all of this by A, and then after I, I do all of that, I can weaken by the uh, B weakened by A. So uh, here, uh, here that kind of happens, but uh, to make it more readable, maybe um, to make more sense of this, let's just see what happens if we uh, remove all the weakenings, which is commonly weakening is not uh, denoted by anything. It's invisible and syntactically. And that's that's what all of these rules about weakening say. So if we remove all the weakenings, then just CSC remains as you would expect in this longer context. So weakening is kind of an should be an invisible operation, and so these equations just reflect that. Uh, so that's what's going on here. Um, so <clears throat> uh, again, we have to conductively state what it means for weakening to preserve weakening. Um, and uh, and just to say that uh, weakening by a closed type preserves weakening because that's a homomorphism, and uh, and then weakening preserves weakening in the slice. And uh, substitution preserves substitution. Uh, so here, substitution by a closed element of a closed type preserves substitution. That's what you can say because it's a homomorphism, and then you're. Uh, recursively require also higher up. Um, weakening preserves substitution. So again, weakening by closed type preserves substitution. And then you um, you ask later on, again, that on the slice, weakening preserves substitution. Substitution preserves weakening. Uh, and then there are a few, oh no, a weakening preserves a generic element. So if Again, state weakening by a closed type preserves the generic element, and then in the slice weakening preserves the generic element. Substitution preserves the generic element. And then there is this law that says that substitution cancels weakening. So if I have, let's say, uh, gamma, oops, gamma in A, now I can. Um, uh, we can uh, something by a uh, maybe maybe a b. I can weaken by a, a b by a, and then I can substitute by the element of of a. But this is an element of a, so this just should should be b. This is what we mean by substitution cancels weakening. So if you first we can buy a type and then we can buy, uh, then substitute by an element of that type that's doing nothing. So here is a law that says uh, doing that gives you the identity homomorphism. <clears throat> um, you also want to state that the uh, generic element acts like the identity. So if we have this generic element delta, um, let's say x and a, uh, in context X in A. And we also have A in A. Now we can substitute A, uh, A for X in A uh, and we get A back. That's what this law says. 
so the, there's a law for that. Um, then there is substitution by the generic element. This one says that if you um, first weaken by A and B, uh, let's say something is off already. Uh, what does it say? Let's have a look here. Um, so you first weaken by O, oh, by the weakening of A. Okay. So we have a B dependent on A. Gamma X and A B. And then uh, we also have uh, gamma X, X in A A because we can weaken A by itself. But this B may maybe it depends on X. Uh, now we can uh, now we can weaken this B by A, and then substitute the identity uh, the generic element. It's like the identity function. So you substitute along the diagonal. That's that's what I'm saying. Then you should just get B back. That's this law. <clears throat> uh, it's it's a bit like precomposing with the with the identity function. So it's a unit law for composition. Uh, so this this is the last law, I think. And uh, and now you just uh, collect this all together into one definition of what the dependent type theory is. <clears throat> um, it has a system. Um, then it has weakening structure, it has substitution structure, it has the generic element, and it satisfies all these laws that we uh, <clears throat> that, that we uh, previously specified. You collect this in a big record, so um, so an element of this type is consists of all of those things, and that's what the dependent type theory is. And then you can play with it, you can construct the slice of a dependent type theory just directly using all of the data. And uh, let's say I'm doing on time. Ah, I took 20 minutes, good. <clears throat> um, you can define a condition on the dependent type theory for it to be a simple type theory. And there is lots of stuff you can do. You can, um, uh, let's see what, I, what else I did. So I, I even made, uh, a dependent system for for fun. What 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 is uh, the notion of type dependency for systems? <laughs> uh, you, those can have sections. Um, so this is all stuff you can find in that file. I tried to define uh, given a universe. I tried to define a system um, using that universe because I noted that I'm not requiring that any of my types are sets. Uh, so I can try, but um, then have time to complete it. Um, of course, you can define uh, morphisms of dependent type theory. That's to get the categorical structure of B systems. Uh, you can say what it means for a B system to have um, to have the uh, pi types. That's this kind of structure and so on. So I'll just leave it here. All of all of the structures in the file. Thank you. Sorry, I, I really like that. I think that's um, sorry. Is, is it my turn? Yes, it's your turn. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like that. I don't understand the um, the identity type side of things, which you called it. Oh, uh, bit, which is fine. Don't try and answer now. Um, <laughs> but uh, but um, um, you know, the at the outset, the co-inductive definition um, is sort of something I was musing over and nearly put in something related to that. And I'd sort of, oh, okay, so here's a connection. So if you have a look at what I call the generalized algebraic theory of metagat algebras, mm -hmm. you see that I've got infinitely, I've got families of sorts indexed by numbers, not one, two, three, which you went, you were thinking, well, I want to avoid that and just use the co-inductive definition. And, and yeah. that, and, and, and I'd started drawing diagrams, which um, 
overlap with the sort of diagrams that I draw in data modeling, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And thinking about how recursive type definitions can be unfolded into generalized algebraic definitions. Sorry, there's just a great tie up with what you've done anyway. Yes. And, and then, That's very and then I, as, um, as a, um, I think we ought to have a little sub project to check off my axioms against the axioms that you have there. Ah, yes, I already and noticed that, that you have only six yeah, axioms yeah. and I have nine well, axioms. Well, we, <laughs> well I, th I think we ought to check them off and, and see if we get the same. Yeah. You know, if I drop one or you drop one, then we can square them up together and just it'll be a little yeah. bit of validate self sort of mutual validation yeah. or whatever. So there, there are nine of them in uh, in this setup, uh, and I saw that you have six of them. Uh, yeah, I'd compress <laughs> them down. The yeah. best <laughs> but it's kind of remarkable that you can just state uh, state what dependent type two is of three operations and. Nine, nine axioms. So I guess the, the reason that you're using in some kind of identity type, if I don't know if you agree that you're using some kind of identity type, or if I, I, just I do. It, yeah. Oh, you do not. But the fact that you're using that is because you're coding it up in this system. Yeah, so I'm coding can't... it up inside type theory. I, yeah. st I still have to state the, the judgmental equalities of the type theory. But now I'm working in type theory, so the only yeah. chance I got to postulate anything is to use sure. the identity type. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've so I've got that now. And how much of the previous uh, presentations, the you know the E systems and so on, mm -hmm. how much of that is the way it is, so that we can code it up in this way? Ah, so there you, you're not so lucky with uh, with the core inductive setup that lets you get around. Um, uh, uh, very basic equalities that you don't want to transport along. Uh, actually, you have uh, very annoying equalities that are coming from associativity of context extension. Um, they will show up immediately, and uh, and I suspect it will make it harder to formalize the definition of an E system. I Think it, will, it won't be terrible because you can just require that all your types involved are but to sets. What ex, but to what extent are those approaches driven by the re, by the desire, if there is a desire, to code mm -hmm. it up in type theory? Ah, um, hmm. Okay. So, um, so for for B systems, very certainly uh, there was from the beginning the desire to to form, formalize uh, all of these um, claims that were made about initial models and so on. Um, I think that's that's what this was for. Um, and um, with e-systems, uh, I don't think initially the motivation was, uh, was that. It was just to try to understand abstract, abstractly what, uh, what are these Okay. Context and so on. How to how to manage them? And it was like a type theory of dependent context. Let's let's say that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any further questions? Uh, then uh, let's move on with the last talk for today, uh, which will be by Jacopo. Um, I should stop sharing my screen. How do I do that? Stop share. Oops. Um, yeah, uh, so last talk of today is by Jacopo Emmenegger, also from the University of Birmingham, and he will present our main results about, about all of this work. <clears throat> Thanks, Egbert, for organizing this. Uh, well, I'll try to stay within 25 minutes. Uh, so I have to uh, apologize. Uh, I think this is this talk is still in a bit uh, of a uh, rough uh, shape. Uh, but yeah, anyway, um, I will um, uh, try to uh, convince you that these systems are equivalent to uh, or that the category of B systems is equivalent to the category of C systems. 
and uh, yeah, this is a joint work with uh, most of the people uh, that have uh, spoken before me. Um, all right, so let's start with um, um, yet another notion. So the first thing I will speak about is this CE systems, uh, uh, which uh, uh, you can think of as a, uh, uh, an unstratified version of C systems, uh, pretty much in the same way as E systems are non-stratified uh, B systems, so that you don't have uh, this uh, um, uh, indexing on, on natural numbers. Uh, and yeah, then we'll see how the C systems can be seen as, as stratified CE systems. Uh, and then the, uh, the equivalence uh, between B systems and C systems will be a restriction of an equivalence between a category of E systems and the category of CE systems. Um, uh, yeah, in particular, we have, a, a, I mean, CE systems, CE systems look a bit more general. So we just have a, a sort of uh, embedding of E systems into CE systems. Uh, but by restricting this, uh, we get the, the, uh, the equivalence we look for. Uh, all right, so let's get uh, to CE systems. CE system consists of uh, a class of objects or a set of objects uh, together with two category structures on it. So uh, I will refer to this as uh, the category of families and to this one as the category of terms, sometimes. Uh, and then we have an identity on object functor that maps families into terms. Uh, and uh, families have a terminal object, which is not necessarily terminal in the category C, though. And finally, we have a choice of pullbacks. Um, this should look pretty familiar, uh, of course. Uh, so for every family, uh, we can we can pull it back along any arrow in the category of terms, uh, and we have a choice of these pullbacks, and this choice must be functorial, both in uh, in the terms and in the families. And uh, as I said, the terminal object is not necessarily terminal in C, but when it is, we say that the CE system is rooted. Um, Okay, so, um, and then we have, of course, a notion of a morphism of CE systems, which is a commuting square of, of functors. Uh, you have a functor between families and a functor between uh, categories. And the one on, on families must preserve the terminal object uh, strictly. Um, and of course, it must preserve, two functors must pre preserve the, the choice of pullbacks as well. Uh, and then we, uh, yeah, this is the category of CE systems and their morphisms. And you have a, a full subcategory on rooted CE systems. And uh, we don't need to require that FC preserves the terminal object uh, just because on, on objects, it has the same action as, as F, uh, as the functor on families. Uh, so it's, it's enough to have a full subcategory. Um, all right. So, um, then we can uh, stratify this CE systems. Uh, but before that, uh, um, uh, let me make this uh, small observation that whenever you have a category which is stratified by some functor, uh, so recall that this uh, stratification means that this L is going from this category F to the opposite of the poset, uh, sorry, that's the opposite of the poset on natural numbers. Um, and moreover, uh, so every object of F uh, has a length. Um, and uh, in particular, we can also factor each uh, arrow in F uh, into uh, uh, what I like to call individual arrows. Uh, so these are uh, arrows such that the, the length of the object decreases only by one uh, from the domain to the codomain or that the difference between the length of the domain and the codomain is, is only one. Um, right, and whenever we have such a stratified category, we can stratify uh, each of its slices as well, just by subtracting the uh, length of the, 
uh, of the object gamma that we have here. Um, and then we say that the C system is stratified if the category of families is a stratified category in, uh, in the sense uh, that Paige talked about. Um, and then moreover, we need to require that each pullback functor, which is given by the choice of pullbacks uh, that I've shown you before, each of these functors must be a stratified functor. So it must preserve this uh, stratification on the two slices. And this is equivalent to, uh, to say that this equation must hold. Uh, and uh, I like to think of, of this formula as a sort of generalized Grassmann formula. from uh, vector spaces. And, um, and why is that? Um, well, uh, perhaps this uh, example of CE system can, uh, can give a hint. Uh, um, so we can take the category of matrices. Uh, this category has, has objects just in natural numbers. And uh, an arrow from a natural number to another is uh, a matrix with uh, as many rows as the as the number in the codomain and uh, as many columns as the number in the domain, uh, and we can yeah composition is just matrix multiplication, um, and uh, of course we have a, a a map from n to the objects uh, and we can lift this to a functor from this opposite on the positive of natural numbers. Um, uh, by uh, yeah, mapping this, uh, uh, this morphism. This is an arrow in, in this poset. And we map it to this matrix, which is the identity matrix uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the codomain, if you want, with uh, k uh, columns added at the end. Uh, and the, uh, this, uh, well, uh, it's clear that uh, this will uh, we can define a stratification for this uh, for this category uh, n. I mean, you just have the, the uh, identity functor, uh, and this stratification on, on, on this guy lifts to a stratification on the uh, on the whole CE system actually, uh, where in particular the factorization of a, uh, of an error like this is is given as below where uh, each of these is just the identity on say M or M plus one or whatever with only one column of, uh, of zeros. So you have the identity, one column of zeros, one identity, one column of zeros and so on and so forth. Uh, and you can factor all this in this way. Um, and finally, the choice of pullbacks is uh, is given here. Um, uh, so in particular, you see that this, uh, this upper projection uh, is like applying A to the first, uh, to the first N, uh, uh, so the, 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 the first N part of the, of the input, and then uh, is doing nothing on the, on the remaining K. Um, and uh, since we can uh, we can write this n plus k in this way, uh, it's just very straightforward arithmetic. Uh, this is telling us that the pullback functor is a stratified functor, so that uh, this whole CE system of matrices is a is a stratified CE system. Um, by the way, you're welcome to to stop me uh, anytime if you have uh, questions. Um, okay, so we can compute this n plus k uh, by summing together the two domains and then subtracting the codomain. And uh, this is precisely uh, what it means for a CE system for the pullback functor to be stratified, that you have that the length of the, of the object uh, that you pull back uh, is the sum of the two domains minus uh, the sum of the codomain. Um, all right, I mean, this is just to show you an example of, of something which is not a dependent type theory. Um, 
uh, which is good to have. Um, okay, so uh, let's see how we can go from C systems to CE system. Uh, uh, this is something that uh, Paige touched upon uh, also. Uh, I mean, the construction, of course, is, is very similar, uh, or at least the underlying idea. Uh, uh, because as I said, we can regard the C systems as a stratified version of C systems in the same way as the, uh, as the relation between D and E systems. So if you have a C systems, then uh, you can look just at the projection maps uh, that exist for each object, and you can form the free category on them, uh, which consists, I mean, its arrows are just the finite lists of, of these projections. Um, uh, of course, they need to be composable. Uh, and then you define this, this uh, functor i that you need for the CE system, just as uh, taking a list and composing it. So the composite will be uh, an arrow in, in C. Um, and for the choice of pullbacks, you, you go inductively. So in a CE system, you have a pullback of each of these projections. Uh, and you know that your families in F are just lists of these projections, so you go inductively. Uh, there is nothing special here. And uh, yeah, and so the fact that uh, you obtain a, a rooted CE system is because, uh, well, you start with an object which is terminal in C by assumption. And uh, you know that this uh, free category here is stratified uh, because uh, this is something that, that also Paige mentioned, um, the, uh, the projection maps of a, of a C system can be arranged in a rooted tree. And uh, so that the construction of the free category on this, uh, on this graph, which is a rooted tree actually factors through the uh, subcategory of stratified uh, categories. Uh, and uh, I mean, this is actually an equivalence of categories. Um, so yeah, we end up with uh, with a rooted C system. We know that the category of family is is stratified, and uh, yeah, the length of of uh, of an object in the sense of the C system is the same as the length of an object in the sense of the C system. Uh, so again, no surprise here. And and finally. Uh, you know that the pullback functor here is stratified as well, uh, uh, just because uh, of this condition, which is one of the axioms of a C system. Uh, so uh, yeah, so the, by pulling back uh, uh, an individual arrow, you get again an individual arrow, and and since pullback was defined inductively. Uh, uh, you have that it preserves uh, the the length of objects uh, as we need it. So uh, yeah, in this way we get from every uh, from any C system uh, we get a, strat a rooted stratified uh, CE system. And um, yeah, you can go also the other way around. Uh, so if you start with a CE system A. Uh, you take the category of terms as the, the underlying category of the C system. Uh, and since this C system is rooted, you can take the terminal object here, which is terminal in C. And the length function is of course given by the stratification functor of the C system. And finally, we need to define the, the further maps and the projections and so on. So uh, given an object, which is uh, non-terminal, you can factor the terminal arrow into individuals um, in this way. And then you just define the father of gamma to be uh, the object here. So the first one that you'll find by uh, factorizing this terminal map. And the projection uh, of gamma is of course this individual arrow here. And uh, yeah, and the choice of pullbacks is uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's just a pullback in the C system uh, restricted to, to your choice of individual arrows. Um, but here, the, uh, 
So in order to, uh, uh, where is it? Yeah. So we need to make sure that this, uh, that this condition holds so that the father of the object that you pull back is actually the context delta. This is another of the another one of the axioms of a C system, and uh, and this is where you need to uh, to know that your uh, that your pullback functor is stratified, because if you know that the pullback functor is stratified, then it means that uh, it preserves individual errors, so that the difference uh, between these two objects is one. Uh, if f is stratified then the difference of these two objects is also one. And, and that means precisely that, uh, uh, yeah, we can, uh, uh, we know by the previous definition that the father of this pullback is, uh, is delta. Um, and basically this is what, uh, where this, this additional uh, assumption is needed. Um, okay, so uh, in this way, uh, we, uh, we obtain an equivalence between uh, uh, C systems and, and rooted stratified CE systems. Uh, and this is one of the, uh, one of the equivalences that will uh, uh, patch together to go from B systems to C systems. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is what I just said. We have an equivalence here, um, and uh, so I I lost count of the time, uh, Egbert. Uh, how am I doing? Um, uh, good question. Maybe 15, like let's say until eighteen twenty. Okay. So, okay. Yep, that's good. Um, yeah. So uh, let's move on. Now we need to uh, to establish the equivalence between E systems and certain CE systems, um, uh, which will be the uh, rooted ones, of course. Uh, and so first we go from CE systems to to E systems. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, so um, for uh, uh, yeah, to construct the, the E system, you take the category of families, um, and then uh, you need to define the term structure, which is given by the sections of, uh, uh, of the family itself. Uh, and then weakening and substitution are just given by pullback, either along a family or along a section. And, uh, and finally, the, the generic term or the uh, variable assumption or uh, whatever you want to call it uh, is given by the universal property of this pullback here. So it's the diagonal, as Eckbert pointed out. Um, right, and this construction leads to a functor from CE systems to E systems. So uh, uh, you map morphisms to morphisms as well. Um, for the converse direction, we need to, to do some work now. This is where uh, the interesting part is. Um, right, so let's start with an E system with a category, a terminal object, uh, a term structure, weakening, substitution, and uh, variable assumption, uh, and pick an object in the, in the category F. Uh, then we can look at this, uh, this set of terms. These are the terms, if we think in, in terms of dependent type theory, these are the terms uh, um, uh, of type P uh, in, in the context extended by A. So it's something like this. Uh, but P does not depend on, on, uh, on X, right? And, uh, and we think of these guys here as these uh, elements of this set as the internal morphisms uh, of, um, of our E system. Uh, and, and we do this, uh, uh, yeah, probably I should have said that before, because we are constructing a category 
which will be the category of terms uh, of our uh, CE system associated to the E system, of course. Uh, I mean, uh, this this old construction that that I'm going to describe will probably remind you of the construction of a syntactic category of a of a dependent type theory, uh, and you can think of it as an algebraic version of it, perhaps. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the the interesting thing is that it works uh, even if you don't have a, a a length function, even if your setting is not stratified. Um, and then uh, yeah, so we have this set of of what we would like to to call morphisms. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to define a composition and a, uh, an identity. And to do that. Uh, you first introduce this uh, precomposition homomorphisms, uh, which, uh, yeah, is just uh, uh, weakening by your domain and then substituting f uh, uh, into your uh, family or term or whatever. Um, and in this way, you can define the composite of, of two guys like this. Uh, And uh, yeah, and then you can check that uh, this uh, this term, this variable assumption, uh, behaves like a uh, like a left and right unit for this uh, for this notion of composition. Um, I mean, uh, this is precisely what happens in the synthetic category. That composition of of the arrows in the synthetic category is just substitution of terms into uh, either uh, types or terms. Um, right, and in this way we get a, a strict category structure on on this slice category, and uh, and we can do this for each E system and for each uh, uh, object gamma in E, uh, and we obtain a functor from pointed E systems, so E systems together with an object into the category of categories. Uh, and now we need to uh, extend this uh, in order to get a functor, uh, because recall that a C system has an underlying functor that relates families and terms. Um, so, in order to define the functor, uh, we need to have a, a corresponding notion of a family in the uh, expressed in terms of internal morphisms. So the internal morphism associated to a family A, uh, sorry, to a family P, is going to be this guy here. Uh, and as a as a sanity check, uh, uh, we have that uh, pulling back along this internal mor morphism uh, is uh, is the same as weakening by P. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, yeah, precisely what happens in, in type theory. Um, yeah, and finally, again, this function that maps a family to this uh, projection, internal projection, uh, uh, defines a functor that maps this uh, category that now we can call a category of families into this category of terms. Um, right, and this, uh, yeah, this assignation also leads to a functor from pointed E systems to the arrow category of, of categories. So for each pointed E system, we get such a functor uh, and, uh, and the same for morphisms between them. Uh, so what remains is to equip this functor, uh, i.e. gamma, with a choice of pullbacks. Uh, that is, that needs to be functorial. And to do that, uh, First, uh, uh, we prove this theorem. Let's call it the pairing theorem. I don't know if uh, my co-authors agree with this. Uh, I, I invented some terminology before this talk. But uh, anyway, uh, this is a, a actually a, a central result uh, that, that allows you to, I mean, this is essential uh, for, for uh, yeah, providing a choice of pullbacks. And it's telling you that the composition of families uh, behaves like a, a strict or a strong sigma types, basically. So you have that terms of this composite, of this family composite, are precisely pairs 
of a term in A and a term in P with X uh, substituted in the variable of A. Uh, yeah, so this composite behaves like a strict sigma type. Uh, by, uh, sorry, not strict, but strong. That's better, probably. Uh, so meaning that you have a, a definitional eta rule. Um, and from this, it follows in particular that there is a bijection between the, the, the elements of this, uh, of this set uh, of terms of P, if you want, and the internal sections of the internal projection. Uh, and this will be uh, quite important for establishing the equivalence. And uh, in particular, also the, uh, yeah, this guy here is a singleton. And uh, right, so now that, uh, that we know that we have strong sigma type, we can move on and, and construct our pullback. So uh, yeah, here by, uh, to prove this theorem, we, we need to pair two, uh, two, uh, two terms together. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, there is a definition of this guy that I'm not showing you. Uh, but the point here is that uh, you can pair together also two arrows. So if you have a, a, an internal morphism from A to B and another internal morphism of this shape, which you can think of as, uh, uh, as a morphism over F. So you have A to B and then you have P and Q above them like this. Then you can think of this big F as sitting above here. Um, and uh, yeah, and then you show that this square is a pullback by using the pairing theorem. Uh, and uh, yeah, with this with this construction, we get uh, uh, a CE system. And moreover, uh, if you started with a, a stratified E system. Then in particular, the, the substitution and weakening, oh, this should be X or F perhaps. Um, so uh, I was saying the, the substitution and weakening, they are stratified uh, functors in particular. So this means that their composites, which is the pullback functor is also a stratified functor. So it preserves the length uh, of the objects. And, and this, uh, this entails in particular that, uh, that the C, this C system that we just defined is stratified. So if you start with a stratified E system, you get a stratified C E system. Uh, and now we can collect all this into this uh, result. We go from pointed E systems to C E systems. And moreover, we know that we land in, uh, um, into the rooted ones uh, because, uh, because these sets here are singletons. Uh, and these sets here are just the internal uh, morphisms from A to the terminal object of our category F, F over gamma. Um, so uh, this ID gamma is not just terminal in F over gamma, but is terminal also uh, in the sense of the internal morphisms. This is what this, uh, this bijection is telling us. Uh, and that is to say that the CE system you end up with is rooted. And uh, yeah, then we can precompose this uh, functor that we define from pointed E systems to CE systems uh, with uh, yeah, the, the one picking up the, picking out the, the terminal object. And uh, you go from E systems to CE systems. And uh, as I said, you if you start with a uh, with a stratified one, you end up with a stratified one, and and here I also added the fact that uh, you land in in the rooted uh, CE systems. Um, okay, so now we have the two functors going in the two directions. Uh, 
and uh, you can show that these two functors are a joint uh, and uh, the one that goes from e systems to ce systems is uh, full and faithful um, so uh, yeah in, in category theoretic terms you uh, you say this by saying that this category is co-reflective into ce systems uh, so you think of these guys as sort of inclusion uh, uh, which has a right or joint and um, yeah so here is the unit of the adjunction where uh, you start with an e system on the left hand and you end up with a e system on the right hand uh, which uh, well has underlying category this one here uh, and you of course have a functor that maps an object to the terminal arrow which is an isomorphism of categories. And, uh, and you map a term to the, uh, uh, to the set of internal sections of the uh, internal projection. And we know by the, by the pairing theorem that this is also uh, a bijection. So the, this, uh, this unit is, uh, uh, is invertible. And this is, uh, telling us that this left joint is full and faithful in particular. Now for the co-unit instead, here it is. So you have a, a CE system on the right-hand side, and you have another one on the left-hand side, where now the, the underlying category of families is uh, the slice over the terminal. Again, this one here is always uh, an isomorphism of categories. And, uh, but this one is not in general. So what does this psi do? Um, uh, well, on the objects is the same as, uh, uh, as the one above because these categories have the same objects, but on the morphisms, uh, so here we have internal morphisms of the E system E, which is, uh, so here by E, I mean, the E system associated to the CE system A. Uh, and you look at the internal morphisms in, in this E system, uh, which are the sections here. They are the sections uh, of this family, right? And if you have a section of this family, then you can post compose it with this uh, projection uh, given by the the fact that here we have a pullback since this guy is a, is a CE system. And, uh, and in this way, you get uh, an actual uh, morphism from delta to gamma, a honest one, if you want, in C. Um, and because this square is a pullback, this assignation is always injective, meaning that the functor psi is always faithful. Um, but the point is that now this terminal object, uh, well, this object is terminal only in F in general. So uh, this means that uh, this uh, functor psi is not always full. It is full precisely when this terminal object, uh, the, uh, this object is terminal in C. Uh, that is to say, when you start with a uh, rooted CE system. So uh, yeah, you have that the co-unit is an ISO if and only if you start with a rooted CE system. Um, and yeah, this is uh, all we need to restrict our equivalence, uh, our adjunction. Uh, so here we have the adjunction from before. And we know that if we restrict on the right to the, to the rooted ones, then we get an equivalence. I mean, the unit is always an ISO in here, and we know that the co-unit is an ISO in here, if and only if we are in rooted ones. So here we have an equivalence. And moreover, we know that these two functors map stratified stuff into stratified stuff. So we can restrict the equivalence between the two uh, subcategories on stratified E systems and stratified functors, uh, uh, morphisms, 
and between uh, rooted stratified CE systems and their stratified morphisms. And uh, we've also seen before that uh, this functor here is, uh, is an equivalence. And uh, yeah, we have a uh, page as mentioned that here we have an equivalence as well between these systems and stratified uh, E systems. So we, uh, yeah, we compose these equivalences and we get one between B systems and C systems. And uh, yeah, this is basically all I wanted to say. Here is just a, uh, something for future work. Thanks. Very nice. Are there any questions? Uh, sorry if I was too quick. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it is. Oh, yeah, I should point out that by D system here, I mean uh, categories with attributes. Uh, I'm not sure who introduced this terminology, perhaps uh, Wojewalski, but these are probably not the same as the D systems that John was speaking about. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by 0.6? Um, oh, um, Basically, uh, what I mean, uh, yeah, I mean that uh, I guess we know what the C system of uh, Martin Love type theory. I mean, uh, I think of Martin Love type theory as uh, as a dependent type theory with pi sigma universe mm -hmm. uh, and natural numbers and uh, all the nice stuff. Okay, so with the interpretation of those uh, in terms of B systems, yeah. yeah. Okay. And yeah, of course, uh, you can extend five also to other. Mm -hmm type constructors. So uh, yeah, it would be good to know if this equivalence is actually useful <laughs> or, or not. Uh, we don't know that yet. But as I said, it, it I mean, it really resembles the construction of the synthetic category of a, of a type theory. Yeah. So it should behave well with, uh, with type constructors. Guess I'll stop using the term D system. I didn't realize it was already taken. There's enough confusion <laughs> without me using it. I'll scrub it straight away. <laughs> but thanks very much. Enjoyed that. Okay. So I think that's it for today. Um, yeah. Thank you all for. Uh, for a very nice afternoon or morning in the US. <laughs> uh, it was yeah, great to be here, to meet John and uh, to, yeah, to talk about type theory. It's always nice. <laughs> no. Thanks oh, to Martin, you for organizing this. Martin, what did you say? Oh, you just want to wave goodbye. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye everyone, have a nice day. Yeah, bye. -bye. Thanks. bye. Yeah. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.